good. So, Father, we just give you all the praise, give you all the glory. We thank you, Father, for this day that you've given to us. Thank you for this day where your mercies are new today. They're new every morning. And we thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. We thank you for your grace and your mercy, Lord. Thank you that we are able to awake on this morning, on today, where we thank you for the activities in our limbs. Thank you for the strength in our bodies. Thank you for the blood that's running warm in our veins. Thank you for the ability to just breathe, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity to be conscious of our environment, to be aware, dear Father, to go about our daily activities, dear God. We thank you for a good night's rest, dear Father. Um, even for those who may have struggled as they were sleeping, Lord, we thank you that they made it through, dear Father. And um, they made it to another day, dear Father. And so, Lord, we thank you for what we do have. Lord, there are things we can complain about. <clears throat> there are things that we can be bothered with. But, Lord, we know that um, we just count it all joy, dear Father. Uh, we give you thanks in all things, dear Father. Dear Father, we give you thanks uh, for what we have, Lord. We give you thanks um, for the ability to, to endure the things we don't have, Lord. And we thank you for the strength and the mindset to press, to acquire things that we want to have, dear Father. And so we just give you all the praise and all the glory. Father, we thank you because you are our creator. Lord, we thank you that we serve a real God. We thank you that we're not serving a statue. We thank you because we're not serving uh, the works of our own hands. We thank you because we're not serving some vain imagination. But Lord, we are serving you, the true and living God. And we acknowledge you uh, today that you are God and besides you, there is no other. We acknowledge you that you are the creator of heaven and earth. We are not here by some cosmic accident. We are not here, dear father, just through chance, dear father, but you are the intelligent designer, dear father, you, Jehovah, Elohim, the Lord God almighty, you are the creator of heaven and earth. By wisdom, you made the heavens and the earth. By wisdom, you created all things, and by wisdom, you created us. And so, Father, we thank you. We thank you for our very existence. We thank you, dear God, that we were created in your image and in your likeness. And we thank you that you have given us, mankind, male and female, dominion over the earth and all the creeping things upon the earth. Lord, we thank you, dear Father, for this wonderful home that you have blessed us with, Lord, this wonderful home called earth. Dear Father, thank you that we can walk up and down this great planet, this works of your hands, dear Father, and we can reap where we have not sown. Lord, we didn't sow the earth. We didn't create the planet. We didn't create the sun, the moon, the stars, the mountains, the wind, the rain. Lord, we didn't create the grass, the trees, but Lord, you did. And in the in your own wisdom and, to, and according to the counsel of your own will, you chose to create man in your image and in your likeness and hand dominion over to them. Lord, we thank you. Thank you that although the grass is beautiful and although the plants are beautiful, Lord, we thank you that we are arrayed more than they are. Lord, we thank you that we are greater than them, dear God. We thank you that as you clothe the grass, you also clothe us. We thank you for as you care for nature, you care for us even more, dear Father. And for that, we say thank you. Thank you, Father, for meeting our daily needs, dear God. Thank you for food, for clothing, for shelter. Thank you for a bed to sleep in. Thank you for clothes to wear. Thank you for shoes and for couches and for transportation and for cups and for bathrooms and for air conditions and tables and pencils and pens and computers. And Lord, we just thank you for all the things that we have access to, dear Father, uh, upon this, this earth and in our personal lives. Lord, we thank you for the skills and the abilities that you have blessed us with. Thank you for a mind that we can use to communicate and think and learn 
and contemplate and acquire new skills. And we thank you that we can put our skills to use, dear father, to earn a living, dear father, and to create uh, an abundant life, a comfortable life, uh, a, a, a life, dear father, that's filled with joy and peace, dear God. We thank you that we can eat, drink, and be merry under the sun. Lord, we thank you. Why? Because this these are your blessings that you have given to us. And so we we praise you, um, uh, King of the universe, for all the many blessings that you have given to us and have given to us so bountifully. And Father, we thank you today, Lord. We thank you for meeting our needs. Thank you for opening the doors. Thank you for closing doors because you know what's best for us. And so, Father, we thank you. Thank you for this place that we can live in. Thank you for America. Thank you for the other countries that others are living in. Father, we pray, dear Father, that you will look upon the governments all over the world, dear Father. We pray that you will touch their hearts and their minds, help them to make good decisions, surround them with people who know your truth and reveal your truth to them, dear Father. Give them the mindset, help them, dear God, to make good decisions so that we can live in a peaceable land. Lord, we pray that you will bless your church everywhere, that we will be um, to the praise and to your glory, that our lifestyle may reflect the image of Christ. Lord, we pray for souls uh, to be uh, to be strengthened in the body of Christ. We pray, dear Father, that you will strengthen us in our faith, that you will give us the boldness, that you will give us the discernment, dear Father, as Sister uh, Sharon shared in her prayer, Lord, help us to have discernment in this hour. Dear Father, keep us from temptation. Deliver us from all evil. Father, teach us how to love you more and more. Teach us how to deny ourselves. Teach us how to take up our cross and follow you. Teach us how to love the way you love, dear Father. In the name of Jesus, forgive us of our sins and our trespasses as we forgive those who sin against us and forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are indebted to us, dear God. Uh, help us to forgive others the way you forgive us, dear Father. Strengthen us in our families, dear God, our spouses, our children, the family unit. Bless the family unit. Father, help families to become unified. Help families to move as one. Help fathers to lead their families well, dear God. Help the fathers not to provoke their children to wrath, dear God, but help the fathers to love their children and to love their spouse and, and to be the men that you're calling us to be, dear God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we just give you all the glory and all the praise. We pray for this gathering on today for those who are here. We, we, we pray for those that are not able to make it here on today, Father. And we pray for those who are connected with us um, on the internet. Father, we pray that they will be blessed, dear God, through this um, fellowship. Father, I pray that your word will strengthen their faith on today. Lord, we pray for yokes to be destroyed, for burdens to be lifted. We pray for hearts to be comforted and encouraged, dear Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we just pray for souls to be saved, dear God, those that, are, that don't know you, who are far from you, Lord, that they will come nigh to you and they will embrace you and they will lift up their hands and say, Lord, I am sorry, forgive me, accept me, Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we just give you all the praise and all the glory. Look upon those dear Father, who are sick and shutting, dear God, touch their bodies, dear Father, raise them up, dear God, give them the grace to go through, give them the grace that they need to endure, dear Father, Lord, be glorified in their life, in their family's life, dear Father, Lord, if there's any sins that has been committed, Lord, we pray that you will forgive them, dear Father, and wipe the slate clean, dear God, give them another chance, dear God, give them another opportunity, dear God, Lord, help, let them know that you love them, dear Father, Give them the healing that they need so that they can glorify you, dear Father, and be the men and women you're calling them to be. Lord, we just give you all the praise. We give you all the glory and we give you all the honor in the name of Jesus. Lord, we ask that you will bless us in this gathering. Dear Father, let the words that we share be a blessing to the hearer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> so we want to welcome you. Those of you here, we say God bless you and Thank you for uh, being here. Um, had a few challenges as we started today, but um, we we pushed through, and we thank you for that. Thank you for your.
cooperation. Um, thank you for uh, just allowing the Lord to um, to speak to you and to guide you and to um, help you be here on today. Um, we already know that sometimes these gatherings, they seem so simple. You know, it's just like all we're doing is just meeting in a home or meeting in a storefront or meeting in a hotel or meeting in some, uh, you know, uh, temple or something like that, you know, but these gatherings, ladies and gentlemen, is for the building of our faith. It is for the building up of our spirit and our soul. Praise God. And so when we gather with the saints, it doesn't matter if it's just a few people or if it's a couple of hundred or a couple of thousand, we want to give God praise and we want to acknowledge the fact that Lord, thank you for being here. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to not only have my faith strengthened, but the opportunity to participate in the strengthening of the faith of others. Amen. And so we just thank God for that. For those of you who are connected with us online, we want to say welcome. We say thank you uh, for joining us. Praise the Lord. We say thank you for, you know, taking the opportunity to to uh, to, to tune in and to lean into this uh, presentation, this fellowship Praise God. Uh, we know that the Satan is busy, you know, trying to get us so distracted and doing all of the things. Uh, but we know that we're supposed to be redeeming the time uh, because we know the days are evil. And so, Lord, Lord, we just give God praise for giving us a mind to redeem the time, for giving us a mind to want to be here, for giving us a mind and a heart to be here and for giving us the, the, the faith to press our way and to be here and not just be here but to be in the mental state to receive, to be in the mental state to, to, to have our cup poured into, praise the Lord. And so we pray that um, our faith will be strengthened on today. As a way of announcement, if you can just bring this on the screen, we wanna encourage those of you to uh, go to our website, jesuschurchworldwide.com. We had some difficulties with our website on last, this past Wednesday, but uh, we fixed that issue and uh, and we actually expanded the uh, website. We're actually the website is going through some uh, some changes and upgrades. The purpose of this website is actually to benefit the body of Christ. It's not just for this local assembly. It's for the body of Christ at large. And so we want to welcome you to uh, connect with us. Uh, go to our website. And if you scroll down, uh, you'll see or you can actually just click this button here that says join the community and it'll scroll all the way down. And there's a form you can fill out. This form is so that we can connect. Uh, we want we want to be part of the body of Christ. Uh, we want to connect with you and we hope that you want to connect with us. Uh, praise the Lord. You can put in your first name, your last name, your email, your mobile number, your zip code. Let us know where you're c coming from. And then there's a fellowship type. And, and I want you to just kind of see what the options are. We have four options in the fellowship type. Uh, one option is I'm looking for a church home. The other option is I want to fellowship with other believers. The third option is I'm a pastor looking for fellowship. And the fourth option is I need help planting a local church. Um, I believe that any one of those four options uh, should be uh, feasible for you. We want to connect with you, but we also want to serve you as well. Um, and the more, the little bit more that we know about you, the better position uh, we are, will be in to be able to, to help you and to support you. Uh, we don't want to do this. We don't want to walk this walk alone. We don't want to um, do this all by ourselves. And we don't want you to do all this by yourself. We are the body of Christ. There's one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. There's only one church, and we want to be connected with that one church. And that one church includes you and me. Amen. Also on our website, there is a blog section. If you click on that blog, um, you'll see uh, some articles coming up. Uh, these are teachings. They're uh, Bible teachings. We put our Bible studies on here. Um, and we're, every week we're going to be adding multiple uh, lessons to uh, this blog article section. Uh, this section is where you can read articles and watch videos to strengthen your faith. Um, I'm actually going to be starting a series where I go through the New Testament each chapter in the entire New Testament, Testament from Matthews all the way to Revelations. And the goal is to provide 
um, uh, teachings to the body of Christ for this local assembly and for local assemblies uh, worldwide. Um, I want to share with you what God has been putting on my heart concerning the New Testament, concerning the Bible, concerning all these verses in the New Testament. And so we're going to go through chapter by chapter, verse by verse, from Matthew all the way to the book of Revelation. It's going to take quite a while, uh, but you just keep on checking each week. You're going to see more and more uh, books and chapters where um, I provide uh, biblical, uh, godly commentary on what the Lord has been sharing with me concerning the Bible. Now, here's the other thing. I want to encourage you to participate on our website. Um, if the Lord has been speaking to you, if the Lord has been giving you understanding and various topics, various scriptures, I want to welcome you to provide your videos and provide your articles so we can post them on the website. Remember, a lot of churches tend to be very secularized. They tend to be very um, just all about what they're doing, right? Uh, they, they rarely do they share, rarely do they um, work together with others. They're mainly just focused on what they're doing and, and that's it. Um, we've been around the block for a while and we've realized this is not what God had in mind when he built his church. The church is a family. And so uh, I, I'm creating resources uh, and using technology to create a platform that can benefit the body, not just this local church, but the local churches that we connect with. So if you have articles or videos um, and you want to uh, share that with the world, we encourage you to send us your articles, send us your videos so that we can also post them on the website um, and and provide um uh, that information to the world. The other thing uh, we want to encourage you to do is to connect with us. We're about to, I think by next week, we should have this up. By next week, we should have a section on our website. It's called a fellowship finder, right? Uh, as you know, we are online and we get people from various parts of the world who is looking for a church home. They want to connect, uh, but they're far from us. And so for those of you who are perhaps meeting in your home, perhaps uh, you have a fellowship, maybe you're in a storefront, maybe you're in a hotel, maybe you have a building that you 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 have for that for fellowship purposes. I want to encourage you to submit your information to us so that we can connect with you and share your information on our website so that when people come to the website, uh, they can click on this fellowship finder. We should have that up by next week, the fellowship finder, and they'll begin to see uh, other churches or other groups um, that are available for fellowship uh, uh, near their area. This is so, so important, ladies and gentlemen, um, because the church is so disjointed. The church is so divided. And I want to play my part in um, doing things that work towards unity, doing things that works towards partnership, doing things that work towards building the kingdom of God. All right. And then finally, I want to, well, two more points on the website. I want to draw your attention to the uh, prayer request section on our website. It's just a simple page where you can just put in your prayer requests, right? Uh, you don't have to go through it alone, right? Just put in your prayer requests and uh, we will be praying for you. All right. And then last, lastly, uh, if you click on the contact us, um, you will see the times that we gather. We have a home Bible study and communion. We do this every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. For those of you who want to come physically and connect with us and join us, we encourage you to come and to our location. There's also a map where you can get to us and get easy directions. Our seating is limited because we do meet in our home. Um, and then we also meet in other people's home. And, and there are others uh, who will be opening up their homes um, so that the people of God can can find fellowship. Right. Uh, so go to our website, click on the contact us. You will see the times that we gather. You will see a link to get driving directions. And for those of you who want to watch online, there's a on that same page, you can click on a button that will take you to our YouTube live section and you can watch our gatherings live. All right. Um, and then there's a contact information, email and phone number where you can get a hold of me. All right. Um, so keep us in prayers. We've been doing this for a long time and I feel like um, the Lord has us in this this uh, this journey where we have taken a shift 
And uh, this shift uh, is more work, but it's so much less stressful. Um, and I praise God for it. And so we're going, but we're still going to keep preaching and teaching the truth. We're still going to be discipling. We're still going to be doing outdoor ministries. We're still going to be showing acts of benevolence. Uh, in fact, we are actually in a position to do things greater and to do more uh, being uh, uh, as we have taken the shift that God wanted us to take. And, and so I praise God for that. Right. At the end of the day, we're supposed to you know, Jesus said, occupy till I come. And so we you have to know what God has called you to do, ladies and gentlemen, and you need to do it. Don't get sidetracked doing other stuff. Don't get sidetracked copying other people. Don't get sidetracked following other people's agenda. Don't get sidetracked, you know, uh, by the wealth of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. Don't get sidetracked by any of these stuff, but remain focused to what God has called you to do. And if you do that, you will reap in due season if you faint not. All right. So uh, that concludes the announcements. And um, so today we we hope you came to learn and we hope that your spirit is in a, in a posture of receiving because we have uh, something to share on today that should benefit all of us. Um, so if you bring that up on the screen today, we're going to be talking about our topic is entitled uh, Beware of the Spirit of Slopefulness. This is part of our church reformation now. And uh, the subtopic is Beware of the Spirit of Slopefulness. Beware of the Spirit of Slopefulness. Some people may say, well, now, how does that coincide with church reformation now? Well, one of the places and one of the areas where we need to reform is we need to reform ourselves in our activities, in our area of concern, in our uh, area of, of, of attention. Uh, we need to we need reform there. Right? Not only are many people walking away from the faith, but many people are leaving the church. But here's another thing. Many people are losing their steadfastness. And when I say losing their steadfastness, we're not just talking about in the church. We are talking about in various areas of their life. And so um, this lesson is for all of us. I, I believe in this lesson. All of our toes are going to be stepped on um, all of our toes. You know, you, you know, it, it, it you know, some of you eight toes might get stepped on, one toe might get stepped on, three toes, right? But even me, my toes has already been stepped on as I'm the Lord is speaking to me concerning this presentation. And as I'm preaching, I, remember, I'm preaching to save myself and them that hear me. All right. So I want to put that disclaimer there that that none of us are exempt for this, right? Where Bible says to confess your thoughts one to another and pray for one another that you be healed. And one of the things that the Lord wants us as the body of Christ to understand is that we need to be aware of the spirit of slothfulness. Let's get into it. All right. So what you're about to learn, ladies and gentlemen, is part of spiritual warfare. Right. A lot of people, they put spiritual warfare in a box. They put spiritual warfare in the box of just prayer or in the box of an altar call or in the box of going to a church service. Right. And they they limit they limit how to participate. Uh, in spiritual warfare. They're like, well, if I just pray, then I've done my spiritual warfare. Well, if I just read the Bible, then I did my spiritual warfare. Well, if I just go to church, then I did my spiritual warfare. And I'm like, no, ladies and gentlemen, that's just scratching the surface. You're just, you're basically just scratching the surface. There's a lot more you need to do when it comes to spiritual warfare. So what you are about to learn today is part of spiritual warfare. Okay. <clears throat> This is what you got to do after you pray, right? This is what you got to do after you fast. This is what you got to do after you come to church. There's a list of things that God uh, uh, requires of you. There's a list of things that your parents require of you. There's a list of things that your spouse requires of you. There's a list of things that your government requires of you. There's a list of things that your boss on the job requires of you. There's a list of things that your friends and your require of you. And there's a list of things that the church requires of you. And there's a list of things that your children require 
of you. And ladies and gentlemen, what you the, the lesson that you're going to learn today is all about being responsible. It is about not being slopeful in the areas where you are required to be responsible because responsibility, ladies and gentlemen, is part of spiritual warfare. Right. You want to win the battle in spiritual warfare, then learn how to be responsible, learn how to do what you got to do, learn how to get tasks done. This is how you overcome spiritual warfare. Matter of fact, this is how Satan gets the best of you. He gets the best of you when he influences you to not be responsible. And the more unresponsible you are, the more drama you're going to have in your life, the more pain you're going to have in your life, the more poverty you're going to have in your life, the more uh, uh, lack of friendships you're going to have in your life, the more missed opportunities you're going to have in your life. And so we encourage you um, that if you really want to fight the fight of spiritual warfare, get rid of the spirit of slowfulness. All right, let's get into this. <clears throat> Um, so a major breakthrough, ladies and gentlemen, and you can take this to the bank, a major breakthrough will come if we apply this lesson to our life. All right. So I have a few areas. There's a few areas where uh, that's the spirit of slopefulness can affect. All right. So the spirit of slopefulness will one destroy your family relationships and vision. The spirit of slowfulness will destroy your family relationships and vision. The spirit of slowfulness will destroy your economic future. The spirit of slowfulness will cause you to settle for a mediocre spouse. The spirit of slowfulness will cause you to miss or not recognize opportunities. The spirit of slowfulness will lower the potential of your inner circle of friends. The spirit of slowfulness will destroy your ministry. The spirit of slowfulness will increase, increase your risk of diseases. And finally, the spirit of slowfulness will destroy your eternal relationship with God. Be aware of the spirit of slowfulness, right? So let's break these down. How is it possible, right, for, for the spirit of slowfulness to uh, uh, affect these areas, right? How does the spirit of slowfulness uh, impact uh, these areas? That's where I want to get into in this presentation, right? So remember, the spirit of slowfulness can affect these areas in your life. It's, it just doesn't affect your church life. It just doesn't affect your work life. It affects every area of your life, right? Every area of your life. So the area in your life where you are slowful right? Then that's the area in your life where you're going to have negative consequences. Here's the other thing. It's contagious. It's like cancer. You can have cancer uh, uh, in one organ of your body and it can spread to other organs of your body, right? The problem with the spirit of slowfulness is that the area in your life where you may be slowful, it can affect other areas in your life. So it's, it, it, it's not just going to affect just that one area where you're slowful, but the consequences tend to spread to other areas of your life. OK, so I'm going to say this again so that we can all get this. The spirit of slowfulness, right? The spirit of slowfulness will destroy your family relationships and vision, destroy your economic future, uh, cause you to settle for a mediocre spouse, cause you to miss or not recognize opportunities, lower the potential of your inner circle of friends, destroy your ministry, increase your risk for the disease, uh, and destroy your eternal relationship with God. The spirit of snowfulness can mess you up big time, right? So what is slopefulness? Slopefulness is lack of concern. It is apathy. Lack of concern. Apathy, right? Slopefulness is lack of inquisitiveness, right? Inquisitiveness is just just the the ability or to just to desire to want to know more the the desire to 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 want more insight the desire to ask questions right slopefulness is a lack of inquisitiveness slopefulness is a lack of preparation right it's a lack of preparation 
slowfulness is procrastination, right? Procrastination doesn't mean inaction. It just means delayed action. You delay it so long and then you do it later. Sometimes you do it too late. Sometimes you do it at the last minute, right? That's what procrastination is. Um, and then slowfulness is also inactivity. It's when you just don't do anything at all, right? And finally, slowfulness is disobedience. So slow, again, I, I'm going to repeat this again so we can break it down and take our time going through this, right? Because we, with all I getting, we want to get an understanding. Slowfulness is a lack of concern, right? You, you're you're a part of something, but you lack concern. You lack concern, so you don't care whether it progresses or not. You don't care whether it's successful or not. You don't care whether it grows or not. It's a lack of concern, right? You don't care whether or not that person, uh, you know, uh, gets what's best for them. You because you don't care, right? It's apathy. There's no feelings involved, right? Again, slowfulness is uh, same thing with lack of concern. It's like I don't really care what the what God is concerned about. I don't care about the mission of the church. I don't care about the mission of my family. I don't care about the mission of my marriage. I don't care about the vision of my own life. Right. My personal life. It's a lack of concern. It's apathy. Just going through life with no concern. No concern on things that really matter. I'll put it that way. No concern on things that really matter. Your future should matter to you. Right? The Your financial future should matter to you. Your family future should matter to you. Your future health should matter to you. Right? Your future relationships should matter to you. You see what I'm saying? Your eternal destiny should matter to you. The concerns of God and the laws of God should matter to you. But when you're slowful, there's a lack of concern. There's a lack of concern. I don't really care about my future. I just want to do stuff that makes me happy right now. And right now, laying in the bed is, makes me happy. Right now, just eating makes me happy. Eating whatever I want makes me happy. Right now, staying away from everybody makes me happy. I don't need to be bothered about what's going on in the world. I don't need to be bothered what's going on in, in the neighborhood. I don't need to be bothered what's going on in my family. Right? Just leave me alone. I'm good right where I'm at. Slopefulness. Lack of inquisitiveness. Right. I have no desire to ask questions. I have no desire to want to learn. I have no desire to to uh, I have no desire to want to know more. I have no desire to um, to be better. I have no desire to read the book. Right. Some people are like, oh, my gosh, I didn't know that. Well, you didn't know it. Why? Because you had no inquisitiveness to read. Right. You had no inquisitiveness to want to learn. You had no inquisitiveness to pick up uh, to read that article or to go to that blog. Right. You had no inquisitiveness to to ask questions. And so you you walked away with your questions. You walked away not knowing because you wasn't inquisitive enough. You didn't have enough interests. Slowfulness is also a lack of preparation. It's a lack of preparation. I just didn't prepare. A test came, but there was no preparedness. I didn't prepare for the test, right? I didn't prepare for the wedding. Lack of preparedness. You getting married, but you didn't pre prepare for marriage, right? You, you you didn't prepare for college. You didn't do that good in school. Uh, you didn't prepare to own a car. So you can never get one. Because you didn't prepare for the down payment or you didn't work hard enough to get one. You didn't prepare for your own home. So you don't have a home. And if you do get a home or you do get an apartment, you lose it because you're not preparing yourself. You know, you, you didn't count up the costs. You know, some people go to events, right, that they didn't prepare for. And guess what? Um, 
they're not dressed appropriate. Right? You go to you go to an event where it should be semi-formal and you show up, you know, with shorts and baggy pants, right? Or sweatpants. You know what I mean? You didn't prepare properly for the event. Lack of preparation. You didn't prepare for the sermon. So the sermon was ineffective because you didn't spend enough time in prayer. You didn't spend enough time studying. You didn't spend enough time gathering the facts and gather, gathering your evidence. You didn't spend enough time, watch this, on your speaking skills. And then sometimes we want to get mad at mega ministries. You know, well, one, one thing in common that these mega ministries have is that they take the time to speak well. Have you taken the time to speak well? How often do you stand in front of the mirror and prepare yourself? You're about to speak to 10 people. You're about to speak to five people. You're about to speak to 500 people. You're about to have an opportunity of a lifetime and speak to 10,000 people. You're about to speak to a million people. Have you prepared yourself? Lack of preparation, ladies and gentlemen, lack of preparation. Here's another one. You lose the war because you was unprepared. You came to a gunfight with a knife. Y'all got that? You came to a gunfight with a knife. And how are you going to win a battle? And you got a knife and they all got machine guns and, and AR-15s and tanks. Right. You didn't prepare for war. You didn't prepare for mental war. You didn't prepare for propaganda. You didn't prepare for those things. So what does it do? It conquers you when you don't prepare. Right. When you don't prepare. Let's keep going. Procrastination. Slowfulness is procrastination. Waiting too long to get something done that needed to be done. Waiting too long for the oil change. Waiting too long to check your tire. Waiting too long to cut your grass. Waiting too long to, to fix that machine that was broken. Waiting too long to maintain your house or to uh, to to keep your house clean or whatever it is. And how many of you know that the, the longer you wait to fix things, the worse things get. The longer you wait uh, to prepare for things, the less prepared you're going to be. Procrastination. You decided to pack at the last minute. You decided to study at the last minute and the subject and the test is too hard for you to be waiting 30 minutes before the test. Way too many questions, way too many subjects to cover. You didn't prepare enough. It was procrastination, just waiting too long, waiting too long to get ready, waiting too long to get things done. So what ends up happening? Either it doesn't get on, it doesn't get done on time, right? Or it gets done, but it gets done in a mediocre fashion. Procrastination. Slowfulness is also inactivity. Just, you just didn't get around to doing it. You know you needed to do it, but you just didn't get around to doing it. You see, you just didn't get around to doing it. Inactivity. I know I should do it, but I didn't. I know it should be done, but I didn't do it. Not I'm going to do it later. I just don't do it. You know, I don't go to class. I don't study. I don't learn how to be better. I don't learn how to present myself. I don't learn the rules of the game. I don't learn the rules of engagement. I just don't do it. And what, what ends up happening? Opportunity is lost. You know, new friendships never grow, never happen. 
You're too inactive. Well, I want a husband and I want a wife, but you're too inactive. You don't go nowhere. You don't expose yourself. And when I say expose yourself, I'm not talking about exposing your body parts. I'm just talking about you're not out there. How can a man find you? <laughs> right? How can you find a woman when you're stuck at home? How can you find a woman when you're stuck at church services all the time? And there's only eight people in your Bible study and all the women there are married. How are you going to find a woman, find a wife? When you constantly stay in environments. Where single women aren't present, you never position yourself to find a single woman. You're just inactive. All right. Bible says he who finds a wife finds a good thing. What does that mean? It means that that man has to be what? Active in his search. You got to be active. It's like fishing. You can't go fishing in the desert. Right? In order to go fishing, you got to be around water where there's fishes in. That's how you go fishing. And then you need the bait. Right? You need to go into the water or you need to be close by the water with your your fishing rod. Inactivity. You want your business to grow, but you don't send out any marketing emails. You want your business to grow, but you don't learn how to become the salesperson that you need to become. You want your business to grow, but you're afraid to sell. You're afraid to charge what you should be charging. You're afraid to you're afraid or just inactive at learning the, the skills of the trade. You're inactive. You want a ministry, but you don't want to do the work. Inactive. And finally, slowfulness is disobedience. Not, I didn't get around to doing it. Disobedience, I just won't do it. I chose not to do it. Not to do it later. No, I chose not to do it at all. I'm just not going to do it. And here's another thing. I'm not going to do it and I'm not going to do it when it's supposed to be done. Either way, that's disobedience. And here's another thing. Disobedience is also doing it in a way that God did not prescribe it to be done. My wife told me the other day, I think she they had went to McDonald's and she asked for what? A vanilla shake. And they gave you a strawberry shake. Right. Disobedience, mistake, whatever it is. But you they didn't give you what you asked for. That's slowfulness as well. Giving a person what they didn't ask for. They asked, she asked for the vanilla shake. You gave a strawberry shake. Right. And a lot of people think they did what you told them to do. Like, no, you didn't give me what I wanted. That's an act, ladies and gentlemen, of slowfulness. Yes, I do believe people do make mistakes, but there's also this thing called slowfulness, where if, if you wasn't slowful, you would have, one, paid attention. You would have wrote down my request. You would have remembered my request. You would have been more diligent. And then not only that, you would have said, hey, do you like this? You would have, you would have finally said after you gave it to them, hey, is this what you like? And they would have said, no, I didn't order that. And you can say, oh, my bad. Let me go back. Sorry for that. I'm, I'm going to correct that right now, ma'am. Right now, sir. Right. So slowfulness is also lack of concern to even ask people, hey. Um, do you like that? Do you like what I gave you? Are you pleased with what I gave you? You know how many times people want to do stuff for you, but they don't want to ask you that. They don't want to ask you, how do you like it? They don't want to ask you, does that please you? Right. You want to know why? Because they're like, oh, my God, if he or she says, no, that's more work I got to do to correct it. Yes, you're absolutely right. That's what wise people do. That's what disciplined people do. That's what diligent people do. That's what good customer service is. Right. But when you're slowful, you don't care. To want to know how they feel about what you gave them. Right. Slowfulness is disobedience. Let's keep going. Eight areas of slowfulness, eight areas of slowfulness. Number one, you can be slowful in your appearance. Number two, you can be slowful in preparation. Number three, you can be slowful in material maintenance. Number four, you can be slowful in personal economic growth. Number five, you can be slowful 
concerning your physical health. Number six, you can be slowful in relational responsibilities. Number seven, you can be slowful in personal spiritual devotion. And number eight, you can be slowful concerning the church mission. Let's get into each one of these. Number one, sloth and appearance. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9 through 10. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9 through 10 says this. Likewise, also, that women should adorn themselves. Actually, before I go on, if there's any questions people have, you can just take those questions. You don't have to do all that, any back and forth conversations. Just let them ask their question. And then at the end, you can ask me the question, then I can respond. Because I want you all to get this, too. All right. Um, so just allow people to ask their questions, but you don't have to respond to the questions. We can respond to all the questions. We can have a question and answer period at the end. Amen. All right. So first Timothy, chapter two, verse nine through ten. Um, reading from the ESV, likewise, also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, uh, not with broided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire. But with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. All right, y'all got that? So here Paul is speaking concerning women. He's like, look, women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel. So when we talk about slowfulness in apparel, right? Slowfulness in apparel, I should have, I should have went to the man first, but we start with the woman. Um, slowfulness in apparel is a woman who doesn't take care of her looks. Not only is it a woman who doesn't take care of her, her looks, it is a woman who is immodest in her looks. That's a slopeful woman. You walking around here with a with a mini skirt, you're slopeful. You didn't you don't have the diligence or the responsibility to properly cover yourself. You know, when you stood in front of the mirror, you didn't take you were slopeful in your in your in your allegiance to femininity. You were slowful in your allegiance to righteousness. You were slowful in in your your obedience towards proper womanhood. So you went outside inappropriate. And that's the result of your slowfulness. You went outside dressed in a way that wasn't becoming a virtuous woman. You went outside in a way that was a violation, right, to to your father, to your mother, to your grandmother. Right. Because a lot of women out here just be like, well, I just do things to please me. No, you're somebody's daughter. You're somebody's granddaughter. Right. You're the daughter of God. You're part of civilization. You're somebody's husband or somebody's uh, I'm sorry, somebody's wife or somebody's soon to be wife. Right. You're some you're someone's a fiance. Right. you're someone's sister. Stop being slowful in how you present yourself. Dress like a godly woman, dress like a virtuous woman, dress like a woman who values herself and values society and values God. Right. So a, a, a virtuous woman. Right. She adorns him, herself in respectable apparel. Her butt ain't all out. Her tits ain't all out. Her back is not all out. Her, her, her belly is not all out. No, she's she's conservative. She's conservative. She's not at she's not at the, the, the beach with just underwears on in a bra wearing a G string around three year olds and five year olds and, and other men and, and what have you. No, she she covers herself. She goes to the beach, but she wears modest bathing suits. Right. And if you want to know what that is, contact Jesus Church so that the righteous women here can inform you and teach you that the Bible says, let the age women teach the young women. Right. And a lot of you age women don't have nothing to teach because you done violated the standards. You're not a good role model. You're 80 years old and can't teach nothing. You're 60 years old and can't teach nothing. If young girls were to follow you, they won't learn anything because you don't have anything of substance to teach them. Why? Because you became slopeful in your adulthood. Right. But but those that's going to change. Right. Right. That's going to change. You don't have to be 20 years old and slowful. You don't have to be a 40 year old woman and be slowful. You can be concerned about your appearance. Right. You can be concerned about your appearance. Let's keep going. Let's move over to the men. Right. Somebody may be like, man, there's no scriptures that talk about how men should dress. And I'm like, yes, there is. But you got to read. You got to read into it. Right. And that's what we're going to do. <clears throat> we're going to get into it. 
Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse 15. Listen to this. So then, brothers, so then, brothers, speaking to the men, stand firm. Watch this. Stand firm and hold to what? To the traditions that you were taught by who? By us apostles, by godly men, not by hoodlums, not by thugs, not by street boys, not by cats in the streets, not by cats in the alleys, not by pimps, not by drug dealers, not by uh, 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 the negative aspects of hip hop. Talking about, I love hip hop culture. No, you should love God's culture. You should love God's culture. You should love God's culture. Don't allow some of these gospel hip hop artists to kind of kind of twist the whole concept of hip hop culture and then try to make it seem like hip hop culture is godly culture. No, it's not. No, it's not. Right. It's not. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us. Remember, the godly men didn't teach you to walk around with your pants sagging. The godly men didn't teach you to walk around with no shirt on in public. Godly men didn't teach you that. Right. Godly men didn't teach you that. Godly men taught you, hey, hey, man, pull your pants up. Godly men taught you how to dress for a interview. Right. Godly men taught you how to dress when you're taking that woman out on a date. Godly men taught you how to properly wear your clothes, how to properly tie a tie, how to properly wear loose fitted pants. Back in the days, men would correct men who wore tight fitted pants the same way women used to correct women for wearing tight skirts and tight blouses. Well, men used to be corrected, too. But now because of the skinny jean movement, many men out here walking around with all these skin tight pants on and your your private parts is so revealing and your buttocks is so revealing but right? your pants are too tight bro you can't even breathe your pants is too tight don't allow these gay people in the fashion industry to influence the way you dress don't allow these gay uh uh these gay what do you call it the people who create fashion designers don't allow these gay fashion designers to now influence the way you dress. Right. You weigh 250 pounds. You walking around in skinny jeans like that. Like that. That's absurd. Like dress appropriate. Dress, dress, dress modest. Men need to dress modest as well. You don't have to have your shirt with in, in, in the top four buttons are un, unbuttoned, showing all your hair, hair chair, uh, uh, chest hairs and all that trying to look sexy because how many you know people think women are the only people who try to look sexy like i know there's not in, in the church sometimes they're not there's not enough teaching on how men should dress all these preachers want to talk about women shouldn't wear this and women shouldn't wear that and women shouldn't do this and women shouldn't do that what about the men some of you men in church look gay some of you men in church look uh what's the word uh feminine feminine Right. You dance feminine. You dress feminine. You talk feminine. You wear your hair in a feminine way. Like, come on, look, be a man, be a man, be a man. Nobody's saying that you got to wear a suit everywhere you go, but you should dress accordingly. And if you don't know how to dress, find yourself. Listen to me, young men, not not just young men, older men. I'm 50 years old, so I think I could I could pull a little bit of rank now. Right? I'm an elder now. Uh, <laughs> I got some experience now. You know, I'm an elder. I'm, a, I'm, I'm above the age of 40. You know, I, I got kids over 20 years old. I, I think I have the authority to, to say things and, and, and to put some bass in my voice now. Right. Some of you got bass, but no money. Some of you got bass, but no family. Some of you got bass, but no ethics. Some of you got bass in your voice, but no integrity. Right. So so I believe I have some integrity, some ethics, enough uh, experience that I can say this flat footed with boldness uh, and, and with and with courage. You know, um, if you want to learn how to dress modestly, young men, take your advice from godly men. Take your dress code advice from godly men some of y'all out here y'all want to go to interviews with sweatpants on y'all want to take a woman out on a date with sweatpants on like i just think everything is just 
sweatpants and sne sneakers, sweatpants and sneakers, sweatpants and sneakers, and a hoodie, a hoodie, a hoodie. What I'm going to wear? A hoodie. What I'm going to wear? A hoodie. Well, I'm going to church. What I'm going to wear? A hoodie. I'm going out to eat with some friends. A hoodie. I'm going I'm going to this woman's house to introduce myself to her father. What are you going to wear? A hoodie. Like, bro, like, dress for the occasion. They dress for the occasion. There's a dress code for a wedding. There's a dress code for a funeral. There's a dress code for going to church. There's a dress code for, for just hanging out. There's a dress code for going to the ballpark, right? You don't wear a suit to the ballpark. You wear you wear something that you don't mind getting dirty, something where you can be more athletic. But if you're going to a wedding, even Jesus says, where is your wedding garment? Where's your wedding garment? You go into a funeral, you know what the culture, what reasonable, what conservative culture requires. It's okay when you go into a funeral, you wear all black. When you go into a funeral, you 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 basically you dress in a way of uh, because the black in that context represents mourning. So I'm not going to wear a white suit to 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 a, to a funeral. I'm not going to wear some pink outfit to a funeral. I'm not going to wear some light blue suit to a funeral. No, I'm going to dress respectable. I'm going to dress a uh, 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 formal, you know, maybe not in a tuxedo or whatever, but I'm going to dress at least formal or semi formal. And, and uh, because I have emotional intelligence. Right. Because I have emotional intelligence, I have enough emotion, that I, intelligence that I can look at my culture and I can say, OK, this is appropriate for that situation. Men, we got to do better. Young men, we got to do better. I, I can't stand it. If you come to me, I got three daughters. So if you come to me talking about, you know, I want to date your daughter, I'm going to look how you dress. I'm like, nah, denied. Denied. You should you should come to me appropriate. You should come to me appropriate. I'm about to, you know, you, you're asking, you, you, you want to, you want one of my daughters to be your princess. You want my, one of my daughters to be your queen. You better come to me dressed like a king. You better come to me dressed like a prince. And you better treat me as her king. Why? Because I'm her father. You're coming into my kingdom to get one of my princess. Right. So dress accordingly when you step into the presence of greatness. And if you young men don't have that ability, if you can't discern when you're stepping into the presence of greatness, when you stepping into the presence of another man, of another great man, if you don't have enough common sense to do that, then you need to learn. You need to learn. You need to learn. So then, brothers, stand fast and hold to the what? Traditions. In other words, the proper guidelines, the, the, the ethical behavior, the godly principles, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate, that you was taught by who? By us, by us, the apostles, by the disciples of the apostles, either by our spoken word or by our letter. And I love what Paul says in another passage. He, he says, um, we have given you what? An example. We have given you an example. I understand that that there's a, a slight dress code. There should or perhaps be a slight dress code difference sometimes between young and old. But the distinctions that we see is just ridiculous. You know, your pops and your mom is dressed all conservative and you walking around dressed like a hoodlum. You walking around dressed like like you just got out of prison. You walking around dressing like 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 you homeless. You know, like what's good talking about? You want a girl talking about you want to get married, talking about you want a ministry. Nah, like learn how to dress, learn how to dress. Stop being slowful in your dress. Wash your clothes. <laughs> Make sure your clothes are clean. Make sure your clothes are iron. Right. Let's keep going. Ephesians chapter six, verse one through three says this. I'm taking my time with this presentation. <laughs> I'm taking my time. I'm not going to rush through this. Um. Oh, let me bring that back on the screen. We lost it. Um, one second. <clears throat> lost my feed to the uh, to the screen so that they could bring the scriptures. I want I want y'all who are connected to be able to see the scriptures um, on the screen as well. <clears throat> OK, there we go. I want you all to follow along, you know, with all you're getting. I want you to get an understanding. All right. Now, I know some of y'all might be connected and you may not have your Bible with you at the moment. And, you know, you may be looking at it on your phone. And, and so I just want to make it convenient for you to see these scriptures. All right. Bring that scripture on the screen, please. Ephesians chapter six, verse one through three. It says this. I'm reading from the ESV. Uh, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor 
your father and your mother. This is the first commandment with promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Y'all see that? Like be obedient. Uh, children, be obedient to your own to your own parents, right? Uh, be obedient to your own parents. Y'all see that? Let's let's bring that back up again. Uh, children, obey your parents in the Lord. Note that. What does this got to do with dress code, ladies and gentlemen? Because the first people to teach you how to dress is your parents. And some of y'all ignored your parents teaching and you went outside and started dressing in a way that they did not teach you. You looked at Cardi B and started copying Cardi B. You looked at Lil Wayne and started copying Lil Wayne. You looked at Aesop Rocky, Rocky or somebody else and you, you try to copy them. What about your parents who love you more than them, who care for you more than them, who took the time to, to train you and to raise you and to protect you and provide for you? What about them? Children, obey your parents and the Lord. Why? For this is right. They taught you how to dress. You know, your mother who's 60 years old don't got you out here, you know, because some people are like, well, I don't want to look old fashioned. I don't want to look like I'm 60 years old. Knock it off. Your mama ain't buying you no, no dresses for a 60 year old woman. Knock it off. 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 Your pops, your pops ain't trying to buy you no dad jeans. Knock it off. Men, knock it off. You know, your, your pops it ain't buying you to, ain't like, here's some loafers, son. Well, you can wear these loafers everywhere you go. No, nah, that's your dad's style, <laughs> right? Your, your dad still was buying you some nice, modern uh, dress shoes. You just wanted to keep wearing Air Jordans all the time, everywhere you go. That's what it was. You kept wanting to wear, you know, uh, you, you know, your 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 uh, Tommy Hilfiger, uh, you know, or H&M hoodie everywhere you go. No, that you should have different uh, attires for different environments. And and and, and I don't know about y'all, but y'all remember when we were younger, we would go to service. Right. And as soon as we get home from service, what did the parents say? Take off your church clothes. Those are for church. Put on some play clothes. Now we we everything we wear today is just play clothes, play clothes. Every day we look like we going to the gym. Every day we look like we just cleaning up around the house. What happened? Children obey your parents and the Lord. Your parents taught you how to dress. Your parents taught you, or they should have, they <laughs> taught you how to dress for different occasions. They gave you school clothes. They gave you play clothes. They gave you church clothes, right? Uh, they gave you a suit to wear, right? Um, they told you, hey, you should have at least one suit. And if you don't can't afford a suit, you should have at least one pair of slacks and at least one, one or two nice shirts and uh, one tie at least or something. Children, obey your parents. Your parents taught you how to dress. Let, let's not get it twisted. They taught you how to dress. But some of you parents today, you downplayed that with your kids. Your parents taught you, but you didn't teach your kids. Your parents, uh, uh, kept, your parents held the line, but you lowered the bar when you had kids. Your parents took you to church, but you didn't take them to church. Right. So so children obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and your mother. How do you honor your mother and your father by dressing appropriate in the way in which they prescribe to you? That's how you honor them. Why? Because when you go in public, you are representing them. If you look like a slut in public, they're going to be like, isn't that Mr. So-and-so's daughter? If you look like a thug in public, they're going to be like, isn't that Mr. So-and-so's son? Isn't that the preacher's kid? Isn't that the preacher's kid? Isn't that the preacher's daughter? Isn't that the preacher's son? Why they look like that? Why they act like that? Why they dress like that? Put some respect on my name. If you a parent, go to your children and say, y'all better put some respect on my name. Put some respect on the genus family. Put some respect on your father. Put some respect on your mother. When you go out in public, dress in a way that is respectable. Guys shouldn't be looking at you talking about, ooh, I want to tap that. And a lot of times the reason why they saying that is because you're presenting yourself in a non godly woman way. They don't talk like that 
to virtuous women. They might think it in their mind, but they won't have the audacity, ladies and gentlemen, hear what I'm saying. They won't have, many of them won't have the audacity to say that to her, to her face. They're not just gonna be reaching to touch her butt. They're gonna be like, nah, that woman's different. We gotta respect her, bro. Like she's different. We gotta respect her. And then for you guys, same thing. You gotta dress in a way that a quality woman finds you attractive. Not these hoochie women out here. Not these women who don't got no proper training from their mother and father, right? They they think everything looks beautiful. They're like, ooh, wow, that's that's lit. You know, that's that's Gucci. You know, like that's not Gucci. That dude look like a bum. It's not Gucci. But you think it's Gucci, right? Because you got ghetto mentality. You think it's Gucci because you got an ungodly lens. Honor your father and your mother. This is the first commandment with what? With a promise. That means there is a promise that is attached to your honoring of your mother and your father. Let's keep going. That it may go well with you and you may live long in the land. All right. All right. So here's some tips. Here's some tips on godly dress code. One, dress in a way that pleases your godly parents. Dress conservative to modern society. Dress appropriate for the occasion. Dress in a way that complements your gender. Dress in a way that glorifies God. Dress in a way that is godly attractive to your spouse, and if single, attractive to other singles. Avoid being fake. Let's break these down. Dress in a way that pleases your, your godly parents. Your parents should be pleased with the way you're dressed. And if you don't know if they're pleased, here's how you do it. Ask them. Be like, hey, dad. Hey, mom. Are you pleased with the way that I dress? And you will get your answer and respect the answer. Right. Number two, dress conservative to modern society. Nobody's telling you to look like you on Little House of the Prairie. No one's telling you to dress like you know, like you back in the Amish times or the Mennonite times, right? Right? Clothing has evolved. And and here's another thing that we got to understand for the church. Just because clothing has evolved doesn't mean all clothing today is ungodly. There are beautiful outfits that a godly woman can wear. There are beautiful outfits that a, a godly man can wear. So don't think that you have to dress like people were dressing in the 1920s. Don't think you have to dress like people were dressing in the 1940s. Don't think you have to dress the way people were dressing in the 1850s. Dress conservative to modern society. You can still cover up. You can still look beautiful. Right. You can still look conservative. You can still look valuable. You can still look special. You can still portray um, uh, 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 like your identity. You know what I mean? You can still portray your identity because we all have our own brand. So you can still kind of present yourself in the brand that you kind of desire, you know. Um, you may like the color blue. You may like, you know, uh, denim skirts or denim jeans or you may like, you know, a guy may like to dress, you know, uh, one way this way. That may be part of his brand. He 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 may want to have this kind of like, you know, uh, uh, you know, like just I don't know. Just like Saks Fifth Avenue corporate look or he may he may want to have this, you know, urban look, but you can still have an urban look and still look conservative. You ain't got to look ghetto. You ain't got to look ungodly. You ain't got to look thuggish. You ain't got to go walking around trying to be sexy. Nah, the sexiness stays at home for your spouse. And if you ain't married, it's just at home with you. Right? Talking about that lady talking about, honey, I'm home. She's like, oh, snap, I'm not married. You know, <laughs> you know you're not married. So whatever you're trying to do, that's at home. You ain't got to bring that out in the public. Wait. Dress in a way, right? We're going to get to the singles in a little bit, right? So here's the other one. So dress conservative to modern society. Three, dress appropriate for the occasion. Is it a wedding? Am I going to work? Um, you know, and here's another one, right? Is it a dirty job? Don't wear your nice clothes to a dirty job. 
Put on some clothes that you don't mind getting dirty. You over here talking about I'm gonna wear some where you know wear these sixty dollar jeans or this nice you know loafer shoes and you know and, and wear this nice suit. I'm like, bro, you know we're gonna be sweeping and cleaning and you know there's gonna be dust all over the place. Like, no, let me wear something that fits the occasion. I'm doing yard work. I'm not wearing some really nice slacks for that. So dress appropriate for the occasion. Are you going to work? Are you going to a fellowship service? Are you going to um, are you going to the park? You know, are you going on vacation? Watch this. Are you going on an evangelistic outreach? Are you going to the beach? Right. Dress fit for the occasion. You should understand that there is a modest attire that you can wear to all of these environments. And you don't have to disrespect God, disrespect your parents, disrespect the people around you. Dress appropriate for the occasion. Hallelujah. Dress in a way that complements your gender. If you female dress in a way that when people look at you, they don't have to ask the question, is she a female or not? Dress in a way that complements your gender. If you a man, you should dress in a way that when people look at you, they can tell you a man. The Bible says that a man should not put on a woman's garment, you know, and a woman should not wear a man's garment, right? Whoever does that is considered an abomination. And I come to let you know that verse is not talking about women wearing pants. It's talking about cross-dressing. That's what it's talking about, because in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 5 or 22, verse 4, there were no pants for women or for men. There were no shorts. Men and women were walking around in tunics. So what was Moses referring to? Don't let these apostolic movements and the holy, the holiness movement preachers today try to convince you that Moses was talking about pants. He was not talking about pants. He was talking about attire. He was talking about cross dressing. That's why it's considered an abomination, because this woman is dressing like a man and this man is dressing like a woman. Don't y'all understand that women wear T-shirts today just like men? Is she putting on is she putting on a man's T-shirt? Last time I checked, she goes into the women's department and she buys a T-shirt for women. She doesn't go into the men's department and buys a T-shirt. Don't you know women wear blouse today, button up blouse today? I don't see them walking into the men's department, at least not a godly woman walking into the men's department talking about I'm looking for a man's uh, dress shirt. No. What does she do? She goes into the women's department and she shops for what? a dress blouse, a button up business blouse top. Right. And and check. You want to know what the difference is between those two shirts? Men, a woman's blouse has bust marks. For those of you who learn sewing, like I learned how to sew back in the days. Right. And I remember looking at blouses for women and shirts for men. Women, women have breasts, ladies and gentlemen, like they, they have breasts. I'm going to have small ones. I'm going to have big ones. And there's a thing called bust points. You know, that means the blouse is made to accommodate her breasts. Brothers, our <laughs> our shirts aren't designed like that. Right. And so don't let these uh, preachers who don't fully know the history of clothing and don't fully understand what this passage in Deuteronomy is referring to and have you thinking, oh, my God, I, I can't wear pants. Well, if you can't wear pants, you also can't wear socks because men wear socks. You also can't wear a hoodie because men wear hoodies. And the last time I checked, a woman's hoodie looked similar to a man's hoodie. What's the difference? This hoodie was made for a woman. So here's a million dollar question, ladies and gentlemen. That's why we got to take our time and teach. A lot of people, y'all want to come to church on Sunday and y'all want to have all these services geared to unsaved folk, you know? And when, when, when really it's a gathering of the saints, we're supposed to be teaching the saints, right? And you got all these people coming to, coming to service and don't know their left hand from their right hand can't probably discern the scriptures, right? They just want to shout and dance and get emotional. But no, we got to teach the word of God. Right. And the teaching of the word of God should make you happy. It should deliver. It should destroy yokes. It should de de uh, destroy uh, uh, burdens and lift lift weights. All right. This is why teaching is so important. So we can rightly divide the word of truth. Listen to this. A woman's body. Is similar to a man's body from the outside looking in. Right. She has a head. She has eyes. She has two ears, two eyes. She has one nose with two nostrils. She has one mouth. Right. She has hands. She has 10 fingers, five on one hand, five on the other. She has two legs. So isn't it normal 
for men and women back in the days to have similar clothing. It's not like a woman's walking around with three legs and a man has two. And so the clothing has to accommodate three legs versus two. You ever saw when they try to put clothes on a dog, right? And they have to accommodate for what? Four legs, right? Notice how human clothing don't have that. We don't accommodate for four legs because we only have two, right? So Adam was made in the image of God. Eve comes from Adam's rib. So she comes out similar to Adam. She's a wool man. She's a man with a womb. Wool man. She's female. So she's still going to have legs, two legs. She's still going to have hands. So the majority of her body is similar to a man, except her bust points. Her hips is a little bit wider, right? She has different, uh, her private parts a little bit different, right? She has less testosterone. So she may not have hair, you know, on her chest and a lot, a lot of hair on her arms like a man would, right? Some women still have mustache and stuff like that. That's because there's a little testosterone in them and stuff like that, right? But there's some slight, there's some differences between a male and a female. So when it's time to put on clothing, guess what? She has to put the tunic on the same way he puts a tunic on. Why? Her body is similar to his. She has to put on a T-shirt the same way he puts on a T-shirt. Why? Because her body is similar to his. She has to put on a pair of pants the same way he put one leg at a time. Why? Because her body is similar to his. She has to put socks on similar to him. Why? Because her feet are similar to him. She puts them on similar to him. The difference is here's female socks and here's male socks. And if you don't believe it, go to your clothing department store. For all you people like, oh, my, no, 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 pants was made for men. Well, so was tunics made for men. And there was also tunics made for women. There were skirts made for men in the Bible. And there was also skirts made for women. Just like today, there are skirts, there are socks made for men, and there are socks made for women. Who determines what is what? Some people may say God determines what is what. I beg to differ. The tailor determines what is what. Because when he gets ready to he or she gets ready to create an outfit, he says, this is made for a man. This is made for a woman. Got catch that, right? The tailor determined that. So when he made a pair of socks, he said, these are women's socks. These are women's dress socks. These are women's panties. Right. These are men's underwear. You see what I'm saying? The tailor desert determines the difference. And when they create, check this out, when they create the underwears, don't they look different? Yes, they do. Because a woman's private parts is not the same as a man. So they're made slightly different. The T-shirts are slightly different. The pants are slightly different. I mean, you know, a lot of times when they make when they make uh, pants for women, at least back in the days, they, there was no zipper on some of the pants. Why weren't there no zipper? Because... <laughs> Women use the bathroom differently than men. So let's just not get it twisted. I said all that to say this. Dress in a way that complements your gender. Now, here's one thing that we got to be mindful of, right? Although we have men's clothing and women's clothing, society has a tendency to make to 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 push the envelope when it comes to the sexualization of women. Right. They tend to give women shorter shorts. Typically, men will wear shorts to their knees. Women will be wearing shorts like mid thigh, right? Poom poom shorts and stuff like that, right? Um, but a woman can wear loose fitted clothing, ladies and gentlemen. Don't don't let these people fool you. Like, oh my God, no, it doesn't it doesn't accentuate my curves. Well, some of those curves need to be hidden. That's what modest apparel is. You making it so tight, we could see your underwears. We making you, you making it so tight, you know what they say, we could see the camel toe. You know, that's when your, your clothing is so tight, we can see the imprint of your vagina. People in the world, you know what I'm talking about. You young people, you know what I'm talking about. Us old heads, you know, some that goes over our head, but you know, I pay attention to what's going on, right? A camel toe is a woman's when her crotch clothing around her crotch is so tight that you can actually see the imprint of her vagina. So you ain't got to walk around wearing all these tight clothes. You can still be feminine and wear looser fitting clothing. The devil is a liar. Your tops don't have to be so tight that we can just see your nipples poking out. Right. Your top doesn't have to be so tight that that it, it feels like you're wrapped in saran wrap. 
you know, it's, it's just hugging you so tight. Nah, nah, loosen that joint up a little bit. You can still be conservative. And if you don't know how to do that, find yourself a good, godly fashion designer. I just it's just that serious. If you don't know how to do that, if, if you can't find that stuff in the store, contact one of these godly women in the church who knows how to make beautiful clothes and yet knows how to glorify God. And you can get your answers from them. Stop believing the lie. We have options. Stop believing that lie. We have options. Again, stop believing the lie. We have options. We ain't got to get all our solutions from the devil and his people. In order for us to be a light to the world, we have to we have to think differently and do things differently and go about things differently. We got to obey God. So dress in a way that complements your gender, dress in a way that complements your gender, dress in a way that glorifies God. You shouldn't be walking around with shirts on with with, with all kinds of satanic prints on the clothing or with all kinds of uh, prints of idolatry, with all kinds of prints of people who don't glorify God. You ain't going to catch me, ladies and gentlemen, walking around with a notorious B.I.G. T-shirt. You ain't going to catch me walking around with a Tupac T-shirt, ladies and gentlemen. You ain't going to catch me walking around with a T-shirt with Scarface on it. I know you young people, y'all just wear whatever y'all see hip hop culture wear. No, or whatever you see pop culture wear. We ain't doing that. That's not what godly people do. Scarface was not a godly man. Say hello to my little friend. The dude was a maniac. What you doing walking around promoting that? I'm not walking around. You, should, you shouldn't be walking around talking about, well, I'm, I'm wearing Jodeci. Jodeci didn't give praise to God. I'm walking around wearing Janet Jackson. And I'm, no, the devil is a liar. You represent a godly kingdom. The other churches, they don't want to talk about this stuff. They don't, you know, many, some churches do and many churches do. But some of these other churches, they don't want to talk to you about this stuff. That's why y'all don't know this. Some of the things that I'm saying is foreign to you. Right. And, the, and because you're slowful, you're not paying attention because you're slowful. You're not getting into the word because you're slowful. You're just so busy looking at how you look that you don't care how God thinks you look. See, that's the result of slowfulness. I told you I'm taking my time with this. Dress in a way that glorifies God. Dress in a way that glorifies God. Dress in a way that doesn't bring shame to God. Dress in a way that doesn't bring shame to the church. Dress in a way that doesn't bring shame to your parents. Dress in a way that doesn't bring shame to your value as a man or a woman. Dress in a way that doesn't bring shame to your spouse. You know, and I'm, I'm going to dedicate this to many of you women out there. You are married and you are posing on uh, social media. You're a married woman and you just showcasing your body like you're for sale or something like that's for your husband. You picked the husband. So now go home and show yourself to him. Look at we don't need to see it. <laughs> look at your neighbor and say we don't need to see it. Right. If you're in a car, look at your person. We don't need to see it. Only the, the only person who need to see that is your spouse. We don't need to see how you look dressed at the beach. We don't need to see how you look at the spa. Show your husband how you was looking at the spa. If you took pictures, they're not for social media. They're for you and your husband at home. Put that in your little private yearbook or whatever it is or, you know, photo book. And y'all can reminisce about times. So when y'all turn 40 and 80 years old, y'all can be like, man, boy, we sure was looking slim back in our 30s and 40s. Remember this spa we went to? I don't need to see it. I don't need to see how you and your wife was looking way back then. It's not appropriate, ladies and gentlemen. It's not appropriate. Stop being slowful. Stop being slowful in your dress code. It's not appropriate. Showcase yourself to your husband, ladies. You first ladies, so-called first ladies, you pastor's wives, you deacon's wives, you wives of husbands. Showcase yourself to your husband. Get that crap off of the Internet. And, and it's not crap. It's only crap when you showcase it. Right. It's crappy behavior. It's crappy disclosure. Right. It, it, it's crappy publication. It's not modest. It would be beautiful if you did that to your husband in private. But because you went public with it, it's disgraceful. You go into the gym. I don't need to see your butt going to the gym and you posing for all the weight you lost. No, showcase that to your husband. You went to gym so that all the other guys can look at you. Is that why you went to the gym? Or did you go to the gym for your own health and so that your husband can find you more and more attractive? Or did you do it for public display? Did you do it so that so that you can show other men and other women how beautiful you are? No, the devil is a liar. Stop, 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 
Stop being uh, flirtatious. Stop being slutty. Like be be disciplined. Have stop being slopeful. Like take that to your home. And a word to the husband, because I believe I'm old enough and I, <laughs> I'm an elder now. <laughs> you know, I'm old enough. And to you husbands, you need to put your wife in check. Keep it simple. You need to put her in check. Like, bro, like you can't be doing that, woman. Wife, approach her as wife. <laughs> wife, you can't be doing that. My dear bride, you can't be doing that. That's not for public consumption. That's for private consumption and i know you look beautiful and i love the way you look and and i love what you're doing and and how the gym is 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 accentuating those curves i love that but lady wife darling sweetheart that's for my eyes only so would you please right now delete those images and offer a public apology why so that other people can learn from this mistake. Let's keep it real. Dress in a way that glorifies God. All right? All right, brothers, we got a lot of work to do. Dress in a way that glorifies God, brothers. Right? We, we can't be glorifying all this hip hop culture, all the negative debauchery stuff in our culture. Right? We, we don't want to be, we don't want to do that. We want to glorify God. When people look at us, we want them to say, man, that is a godly man right there. That, 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 that's a godly man. That is a handsome, godly man. That don't be like, oh, no, that's a sexy man right there. No, because we shouldn't be going around trying to look sexy. We should go around trying to look appropriate. Dress in a way that is godly. Here's a good one. All of them were good, but I think this is going to, you know, People love talking about relationships. So dress in a way that is godly attractive to your spouse. And if single, attractive to other singles. Right? The church, church folks need to understand one thing. Mating season is all year long. <laughs> right? Uh, you need to understand that mating season is all year long. There are women and men in the church who want a mate. And all throughout the year, there are single people in the church who want a mate. And unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, there was a lot of single women in the church who are remaining single for an extended period of time. Right. Dress in a way, ladies and gentlemen, single. Or I, I deal with the married people dress in a way that is appropriate to your spouse and then dress in a way that is appropriate to other, attractive to other singles. If you are looking for a spouse, then you should dress accordingly. You should dress in a way where a single man will find you attractive. You should dress in a way where a single woman will find you attractive. You should dress in a way where, uh, where the opposite sex, who's also looking for a spouse, will find you attractive. They won't just look at you and say, boy, he is safe. But they'll look at you and say, boy, not only is he safe, but he carries himself well. Not he save, but man, his clothes is all sloppy. Not he slave, he sick save, he save, but his shirt is not iron. Not he save, but man, his shoes just, you know, it's just all messed up. Like dress in a way that is attractive. Remember, you're trying to attract a spouse. So look valuable. Look appropriate. Dress in a way that she will feel proud walking down the street with you. Dress in a way where she will feel proud, right, holding your hand in the marketplace. Dress in a way that she will feel proud that when somebody takes her takes your picture and she sees it and she's, you know, uh, and she's like, wow, that's the kind of guy I would like to be married to. And if she's and if you are married, dress in a way, ladies and gentlemen, that your spouse looks at you and finds you attractive. Dress in a way that when they look at you, they be like, wow, I'm glad you're my man. I'm glad you're my woman. It's that simple. Dress in a way that is attractive. And if you want <laughs> if you don't know what is attractive again, sometimes we make this stuff real complicated. You know, they were like, well, I'm going to pray about it. This ain't nothing you got to pray about, ladies and gentlemen. All you got to do, if you want to know what 
pleases your spouse, ask your spouse. Stop asking God. Talking about, well, God is God is my husband. No, he's not. You know, he's your father. Right. He's not your husband in that regard. He's not making love to you. None of that stuff. Right. He's your God. You know, so if you want to know what is attractive, go ask your wife. If you want to know what is attractive, go ask your husband. And for those of you who are single, if you want to know what is attractive, ask your mom and your dad. Ask the godly men and the godly women in your life. Stop taking your cues from hip hop, from R&B, from the world. Take your cues from the godly people in your life. What does the Bible say in the book of Psalms? Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners. Right? Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Don't, don't take your counsel from the ungodly. Look beautiful. Look handsome. You ain't have to go around looking sexy. Save that sexiness for your home, for your private, your private area with your spouse. Other than that, look beautiful. Look handsome, fight, dress according to your gender, glorify God. Here's the last one. Avoid being fake. Man, this is taking a while to go through, but this is good. Avoid being fake. Avoid being fake. Man, if he were to see you in the morning, it should at least be close to 80 to 90 percent of what he sees throughout the rest of the day. I'm just going to keep it at that, right? I'll say that again. <laughs> I'm going to say that again because some of y'all just missed that one. Especially, I got to get on you ladies with this. You know, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I know I'm coming down. I'm, I'm coming down the women's street a little bit more often than I. Um, But I'm just telling y'all, you know, like, yes, you want we, we want you to be beautiful. We want you to look good, but we don't want you to be fake. We don't want you to be fake. We basically. I'm saying this as a father. I'm saying this as a husband. I'm saying this as a man. And I'm saying this as a man of God. And I'm saying this as someone who studies history and culture. Right. You need me to repeat that. Right? I'm saying this as a man. I'm saying this as a husband. I'm saying this as a father. I'm saying this as a man of God. I'm saying this as a man who studies history and culture. Do not be fake women. How you look in the morning should be closely 80 to 90 percent of how you look through the rest of the day. If you look drastically different in the morning, then you're being fake. I'm sorry to tell you, you are fake and no good man wants a fake woman. I could understand if you have a scar, you know, and, and you don't always want to show that scar. But at some point, ladies and gentlemen, the man is going to have to see the real you. And he needs to fall in love with the real you. He needs to feel comfortable with the real you. And the problem with faking, right? A lot of people fake because they feel inferior. A lot of people fake because they 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 have they they don't feel loved. A lot of people fake because they're really not accepted. And so what I'm saying to you ladies is that you have to dress in a way that a man can accept the real you. And if you're constantly covering up the real you, he's falling in love with something fake. He's falling in love with a mask. He's falling in love with makeup. He's falling in love with a weave. He's falling in love with a wig. He's not falling in love with the real you. So 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 what I'm saying to you ladies and ladies is that you need to make sure that you are being authentic with how you look. How you look in the morning should be closely 80 to 90% how you look throughout the rest of the day. And it's that simple. And I believe most men will co-sign what I'm saying. For those of you who are recording this, you can read the comments and, and, and listen to what most men, most men are going to be like. Amen. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, he's right. OK, no, we don't have a problem with you wearing a little bit of makeup. No, we don't have have a problem with you, you know, putting some extensions in your hair and stuff like that. But you better make sure <laughs> that it looks 80 to 90 percent how you normally look when you wake up in the morning. 
because men want real stuff. Men want real. They want real. Right. That's why men, we don't have a problem sometimes showing our gray hair. Most of us don't have a problem showing our gray hair. We don't have a problem looking the way we look. The most we do, we cut our hair. We edge it up, right? Most men ain't walking around wearing makeup. Most men ain't walking around wearing fingernail polish. Most men ain't walking around wearing weave, right? If a man is bald, guess what? He bald, right? He's just showing you the authentic him. If he got a belly, he got a he got a belly. Yeah, you might see some men, a small fraction of men, will put on some tight. What do you call those things? Girdle. But most men, you know, they they let the belly hang out a little bit. They 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 keep it real. And what I'm saying to you, ladies, keep it real. Dress in a godly way. Stop being fake. Let's keep going. How much time we got left? How much time did I take so far? Whew. Okay, I'm going to see if I can wrap this up in the next 30 minutes, okay? Um, I knew this was going to be a little bit long, but <laughs> it's a lot of commentary that keeps being downloaded. All right, number two, bring that up on the screen. Sloth, slothfulness, and preparation. Let's go to the scriptures, Matthew 25, verse one through four. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. And for when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flask of oils with their lamp. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, the ones who weren't prepared, said to the ones who were prepared, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the what? I, mean, I got I got to touch on that. Some people, ladies and gentlemen, some people are upset with you because <laughs> because they didn't prepare and you prepared and they are expecting you to take out of your preparation and give it to them. And they'll call you all kinds of names. I just want to show that. Be careful how the foolish will communicate with you because you took the time to prepare. They didn't. They had the same amount of time as you, but they didn't prepare and you did. And you got to be careful of things like this. It must be nice. Sometimes that's not always a compliment. Sometimes that's a person throwing shade. Yeah, it is nice. It is nice. You're absolutely right. It must be. No, not must be. It is nice. And it's nice because I prepared. It's nice because I did my homework. It's nice because I was diligent and you wasn't. And so I have something you don't have. So I don't need you throwing shade at me. I did what you didn't do. And what do some people say? Do what others do what others won't do so you can have the life that others can't have. So don't be throwing shade at me when I prepared and you didn't. <laughs> you know, when I got money, you don't. When I got oil and you don't. When I can go places, you don't. What are you doing with your time? What are you doing with, your, with the energy you have? What are you doing with the skills you have? What are you doing on your free time? How is it both of y'all had the same amount of time, but the other person made it 10 miles down the road and you only made it two steps, right? At some point, we got to have a personal conversation with ourselves. We got to have a come to Jesus moment and we're going to be like, man, Lord, I think I wasted some time. I think I wasted some time. So don't allow people to throw shade at you. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. And ladies and gentlemen, there are times when you prepare and your preparation, hear me clearly, is for you and you alone. There are some situations where you can't give it to nobody else. There are some so you can't give your life jacket away. I'm going to repeat that. You can't give your life jacket away. Why? Because you only have one. You see, you mountain climbing, you can't give your ropes away. Why? Because those ropes are for you. If you don't have any ropes and you shouldn't come mountain climbing with me, we can't go out in the woods talking about we going and camping and I'm the only one who got gear. Like we all should be gathering our gear because we're, we're all out there. We we're going out into the wild. There's bears out there. There's, there's 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 all kinds of animals out there. There's snakes out there. There's, you know, the weather conditions. We got to be prepared. Don't let unprepared people you know, uh, be throwing all this shade at you because you took the time to prepare. You took the time to do your homework, right? And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered saying, Whoo, and, and, and the wise ain't being stingy right now, right? Some people are quick to call you stingy. Uh, uh, you don't help nobody, but you don't give. Everything you do is for you. No, everything I do is not for me, but there are certain situations. This is for me and I can't give it away. Why? Because I will be foolish if I gave it away. 
How many know that there are some things that you give away and it's foolish to give it give it away? Like, no, the wise answer is saying, since there will be not enough for us and for you, if there was enough for us and for you, yeah, I could do that. But the pickings are slim right now and I got to make sure I'm prepared. Why? Because I want the bridegroom. I want this. This is too this is too good for for this for me to pass this up. And so I'm sorry, but I, I, you know, I don't have two tickets. I only got one. <laughs> I'm sorry, I only got one pair of shoes and they on my feet. I can't take my shoes off my feet and hand it to you. I can't do that. Can't do it. It won't be wise. It's raining outside, the weather conditions, right? No, I got to meet the bridegroom and so I need this to get to where I need to go. Right? Since there will be enough that will not be enough for us and for you go rather to the dealer and buy for yourselves in other words go do the homework yourself in other words you make up for your lack of preparation and look what it says in verse 10 and while they were going to buy the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast and the door was shut afterwards the other virgins came also saying lord lord open to us but he answered, truly, I say unto you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Be prepared. Be prepared. Let's go to Luke chapter 12 and verse 47 through 48. And that servant who knew his master's will, but did not get ready or act according to his will. Got to read that again. And that servant who knew his master's will, you knew what God said to do. You knew what your boss said to do. You knew what your spouse said to do. You knew what your parents said to do, right? You knew what that opportunity required of you, but did not get ready or act according to his will, will receive what? A severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved the beating will receive a light beating. In other words, both of them are still going to get beat. Both of them are still going to get punished. Everyone to whom much was given of him, much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. You want all this stuff in life. And you better get prepared. Well, I want a good woman. You better prepare yourself for a good woman. I want a good man. You better prepare yourself for a good, good man. Because there's a great weight that's going to be upon you when they come. There's going to be a great demand that's going to be upon you when they come. Let's keep going. Number three, sloth, slopeful in material maintenance. Slopeful in material maintenance. What's material maintenance? Slope, material maintenance basically is how you take care of stuff. Right. How you take care of your house, how you take care of your car, how you take care of your clothes, right? how you take care of your business, material stuff, how you take care of things, how you take care of your yard, right? how you take care of that dog house, you know, that shed, like stuff, the lamp in your house, the, the bed, your bedroom set, your furniture. How do you take care of your stuff? Proverbs chapter 24, verse 30 through 34 says this. I passed by the field of a sluggard, by the vineyard of a man lacking sense. And behold, it was all overgrown with thorns. The ground was covered with nettles and its stone wall was broken. Verse 32. Then I saw and considered it. I looked and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. In other words, he passed by the vineyard, right? It was overgrown with thorns. The ground was covered in nettles and the stone wall was broken down. That means the owner or whoever it was, was not properly taking care of it. Be careful, ladies and gentlemen, you know, be careful of admiring everybody else's stuff and not taking care of your own. You know, you admire the vacation spots, you know, you admire places you can go on vacation Yet at the same time, right, where you live can look like a vacation spot if you take care of it, right? If you take care of it, right? The yard can be great if you take care of it. You can have that curb appeal if you take care of it, right? 
Your house can look good if you take care of it, right? Yes, it's getting older, but make the repairs, right? Make the repairs. He put Adam in the garden to dress it into what? Keep it. That means maintain the garden. It's going to require work. Well, guess what? God didn't put you on this planet for you to just not be doing anything. Work is a great thing. Work is a blessing from God. Matter of fact, we see work before sin came into the world. There was still work. So work should be a blessing, an opportunity. I get to work with my hands. Yes, thank you, Lord, that I get to repair my house. Thank you, Lord, I get to wash my car. Thank you, Lord, I get to vacuum my car. Thank you, Lord, I get to I get to um, fix the hole in one of my, my, my jeans or whatever. Thank you, Lord, that I get to repair it. Thank you, Lord, that I get to iron my clothes. Thank you, Lord, that I get to wash my clothes. Thank you, Lord, that I get to sweep the floor. Thank you, Lord, I get to, I get to do, what do you call the things when you, when you, when you fluff and you dust? I, I thank you that I get to dust around because if I don't dust, cobwebs will come. And then you, before you know, you got spiders. And before you know, I get, to, I, you start seeing roaches and all this other stuff. Why? Because you're simply not maintaining your home. You're not maintaining the yard. You're not maintaining the community. You're not putting garbage in the garbage can. Take care of what God has given you. Take, take care of what God has given you. Take care of what your spouse has given you. Take care of what your parents have given you. And then take care of what you have given yourself. All right? Don't be so kicked to just throw stuff away. Take care of it. Take care of it. Proverbs chapter 14 and verse one says the wisest of women builds her house, but folly with her own hands tears it down. Right. And I'm going to flip this verse. I'm going to inverse it. The wisest of men build their house, but folly with his own hands tears it down. Right. Men and women, we should be building our houses. We should be taking care of our houses. We should be taking care of our materialistic possessions. We should be tending to it. Yes, there should be chores. <laughs> like chores is a good thing. Chores is a righteous thing. Chores is a, is a beneficial thing. I get to take care of what God has given to me. I get, wow, Lord, thank you for the opportunity to be a good steward. I get to be a good steward over the things you've blessed me with. Just because you are poor doesn't mean your house has to look like a mess. Just because you live in a poor neighborhood doesn't mean the poor neighborhood should have garbage all over the place. I drive through the I drive through poor neighborhoods. You know what I see in poor neighborhoods? Garbage cans. You know what I see in some poor neighborhoods? Garbage on the floor. What is that? Slopefulness. Slopefulness. Instead of putting the garbage in the garbage can, instead of putting the garbage in the dumpster, you put it on the floor. And then and then and then you talk about <laughs> wow and then we talk about gentrification. Well, who you think made the property values go down? You leaving all that trash on the floor is what made the property value go down. You being slowful in business made the property value go down. You not maintaining what you have. Some people say, well, well, we don't have enough money. Yes, you do. Yes, you have enough money. The reason the problem is you're looking at money and you're ignoring what the skills and the works of your own hand. You tell me what came first, money or skills. Skills came first. You tell me what came first, money or wisdom. Wisdom came first. So where there is poverty, there's a lack of wisdom. Where there is poverty, there's a lack of skill set. And where there's no wisdom, there's slopefulness. There's slopefulness because when God made Adam and Eve, they didn't have shoes. They didn't have three bedroom houses. They didn't have two car garages. They didn't have any of that. They didn't have no tent. They didn't have no cups. They didn't have no spoons. They didn't have no stoves. Everything you see that man has made, man has created it from the wisdom that God has given him. So here's what I'm telling you by the power of the Lord is that, look, God has given you wisdom. Put your wisdom to work because wisdom is what produces wealth. Y'all are so busy. Like, well, in order for me to get rich, I need the white man to give me something. No. In order for you to get rich, you need God to give you some wisdom. And then you need some obedience and some discipline and some uh, uh, some some stick to itness to work the plan that God has given you. Wealth doesn't come from money. Wealth comes from wisdom. So get wisdom. Wisdom builds her house. Wisdom builds the house. Take care of the things that God has given you. 
learn how to repair things. Learn how to fix things. You may not be able to replace it, ladies and gentlemen, but let me at least repair it and try to make it look as good as possible until I could do better. Number four, slopeful in personal economic growth. Proverbs 13 and four says this, the soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. Wow, right? A sluggard craves so much. Ooh, I want that car, I want that Bentley. Ooh, I want, I want that, I want that Rolls Royce. Ooh, I want that Corvette, right? You're slowful, you ain't gonna never get it. You ain't gonna never get it, right? Oh, I wanna go to Dubai. Oh, I wanna do that too. Man, I want a house with 10 rooms. No, you don't. You just wanna say it. The soul of the sluggard craves. They see pictures and they want it. They see other people doing it and they want it, but yet they don't get the work ethic that's required to get it. The soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. Don't you know there are some things you're going to have to work 30 years to get? Why? Because it's that hard. There are some things you're going to have to work four years to get. There are some things it's going to take eight years for you to get. There are some things that it, wow, there are some things that you won't be able to get at age 23 if you wasn't working to get it the first 23 years of your life. Because some of y'all think what you did in sixth grade has no impact on what happens when you turn 26. Some of y'all think that what you did in high school doesn't have an impact on what's, what's going to happen to you when you turn 29. You, you, don't, you don't see the connection. Talking about you want to make six figures, but you got a D average in school. You got you got poor reading comprehension. Right. You, you got bad reading comprehension. You have poor read. You have poor writing skills. You have poor communication skills. How you think people get those jobs, you know, making 200, not even two. How you think people get those six, six figure jobs? One, you got to be good at communicating. You got to be able to sit in an interview and go through an interview process and convince that person who's interviewing you why they should hire you. Ladies and gentlemen, that requires communication skills. And if you ain't got communication skills when you're 16, you better get it when you're 17. And if you ain't got it when you're 17, you better get it when you turn 18. And if you ain't got it when you turn 18, you better make sure you get it when you turn 19. And if you ain't got communication skills when you turn 19, well, you better work your butt off and get it when you turn 20, because it's going to have a negative impact upon your life. Don't be slowful. Don't be slowful in personal economic growth. Learn what you need to learn. Study, prepare for the tests, learn communication skills, learn discipline, learn math, learn reading comprehension, ask questions, hang out with the teacher, hang out with the people who know more than you. Establish a work ethic, be prepared, watch this, be prepared to do it the first time, the second time, the third time, the fifth time, the seventh time, the eighth time. Now it's in the 10th time it's done right. Do you have the tenacity to do it 10 times until you get it right? Or will you be slowful and not diligent and quit after the second time and say, that's good enough? And that's the problem. You ain't going to win like that. Because what you think is good enough doesn't even pass the test. What you think is good enough ain't worth $50,000 a year. What you think is good enough, it ain't worth $100,000 a year. What you think is good enough is not going to help you make a million dollars. It's not. Why? Because it's not good enough. <laughs> it's not good enough. So you got to raise your standards. But slowfulness will do what? Lower the standards and say, ah, oh, this is good enough. Well, they're just going to have to take it or leave it. And guess what? They're going to leave it. Because the people you're trying to give it to, watch this, is more intelligent than you think they are. The people you're trying to sell it to is more intelligent than you think they, they are. The people you're trying to give this to, watch this, they live in a world that has matured. They live in a world where there's beautiful things. They live in a world where people are becoming more intelligent. Understand, we don't send messages like we used to do 100 years ago. It's a digital age now. And you're trying to live like you in the 1800s and you think you're going to be prosperous in 2024 through means 
of the 1800s? Or you think you're going to be prosperous in 2024 through means that used to be done or practices that used to be done in the 1950s? That was 74 years ago. We got to learn how to evolve. We got to learn how to mature. We got to learn how to adapt, right? But the sluggard is like, nah, this is the way I've been doing it for 30 years and I'm not changing. Nah, you know, y'all can just go ahead on with all that new technology. Nah, y'all can just go on with that email. No, no, nah, I don't want to eat e what? E no, nah, no, nah, no, nah, I'm not, not going to learn how to do it, do it Yahweh. I'm just going to stay in my own little world, stay in your own little world and the world's going to pass you. Stop being slopeful. Just because you old doesn't mean you can't learn new things. That's a slopeful spirit. Talking about, well, I'm I'm 60 years old. We don't care how old you are. You still got to learn. Why? Because you're alive and you're part of a community. There's people who's depending on you. So what does that mean? You got to be responsible. You got to continue to adapt. And the only time you shouldn't be adapting anymore is when you die. You could be rich and still you need to adapt. You still need to adapt. Why? Because the world is constantly changing. Things are constantly improving. Better ways is happening. So you got to adapt. Don't be slowful. Don't be slowful. Right? The dog can learn new tricks. Talking about, oh, uh, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. The devil is a liar. You know, you're going to have to learn new tricks and the Holy Spirit will help you. Proverbs 12 and 24. <laughs> I like that, man. Look, I like that. Actually, Yes. The old dog can learn new tricks. Lord, Lord, give us, <laughs> give us, some, give us, give us, give us that, that some, give us that anointing that allows us to learn, to learn new ways. Yes, Lord, I'm, I'm 50 years old, but I can still learn a new way. Yes, Lord, I'm 55 years old, but I can learn a new way. Yes, Lord, I'm 60 years old and I'm not used to doing it like that. I see these young people doing things slightly different and different and it's blowing my mind. I feel, I feel antiquated. I feel like a, I feel like a, 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 a piece in a museum. I feel like a, you know, like a fossil, but Lord help me to adapt, help me to evolve, help me to still have a righteous character, but Lord help me to, to evolve, you know, so that I can still be of service to people in my life. Lord, give me the anointing. Give me the, what is it? People fail to realize that the Holy spirit is the helper. So, Lord, he ain't just helping you to speak in tongues, right? But help me, Lord, to address these issues in my life. Help me, Lord, to make these adjustments. Help me, Lord, to do things differently so that I can be who you're calling me to be and so that I can be who I need to be for the people that I am in relationship with. Let's keep going. Proverbs 12 and 24. The hand of the diligent will rule while the slothful will be put to forced labor. Wow. The hand of what will rule? The diligent. Understand this, ladies and gentlemen, sometimes people aren't ruling just because they're wicked. Some people are ruling because they are wicked and diligent. Because even in your wickedness, you still have to have a level of diligence. You know, it's like people are like, oh, America is Babylon. America is wicked. How do you think they built those bridges? How do you think they built those subways? How do you think they built those buildings that are 50 floors tall? There's a level of skill and wisdom and discipline, right? They're like, oh, America is wicked. Yet when you get hurt, where do you go to? You go to their hospital. Where do you go to? You go to those wicked people who are surgeons, who do surgery, who study the heart, who create all this equipment, but they wicked though. But there's a level of wisdom and discipline that they have that you don't have. The hand of the diligent will rule. Yes, you go to church, but are you diligent? Have you ever even built a neighborhood? Have you ever built a subdivision? Have you ever created a town? Right? Talking about you're going to rule, but you ain't, you ain't, never, you, you never built a city. Right? Talking about rule. Can you even govern people? Do you have the discipline to govern people? Do you have the discipline to govern 100 people? Do you have the discipline to govern govern 1,000 people? Do you have the discipline to govern a million people? Can you even build a block? Better yet, can you properly rule over your own family? The hand of the diligent will rule. The diligent will rule. 
Don't you know there are some people in America, they're in such a powerful position that it doesn't matter who the president is of America? They don't put themselves in such a powerful position of rulership that it doesn't matter who the president of the United States is. They don't, it doesn't matter if it's a Democrat or Republican because they've created a lifestyle for themselves. But understand this, that came through being diligent. While the slopeful, while the slopeful will be put to who? Forced labor. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be put to forced labor. I don't want somebody constantly hitting me upside the head talking about go build that, go do that, go build that. No. Like we we should, especially in the church, ladies and gentlemen, we we should we should be diligent the same way we're diligent to Bible study, the same way we be diligent to these revivals. Lord, may we be built, be diligent to working hard and to building and to to creating community and to creating being able to build and create jobs and, and create an environment where there's a level of rulership that we have. Regardless of what's happening all around the world around us. The hand of the diligent will rule while the slopeful will be put to forced labor. Some people. Hmm, some people are slaves because they're slopeful. Some people are slaves because they don't know how to fight. Some people are slaves because they don't know how to organize. Some people are slaves because they are mentally weak. Some people are slaves because they are physically weak. Some people are slaves because they are what? Suckers. Some people are slaves because they are unwise. Oh, well, they conquered us. How you think they conquered you? How you think they conquered you? You had to be weak. You had to be weak in order for someone to conquer. Show me someone who can conquer God. Show me someone who can conquer Jesus. So if you've been conquered, that means someone is stronger than you. So what, what should you do? Learn how to be stronger. Someone is obviously smarter than you and wiser than you. So what should you do? Learn how to be wiser. The hand of the diligent will rule while the slothful will be put to forced labor. That's a hard pill to swallow because a lot of times we just be like, oh, no, they were just greedy. No, they were stronger. We were weaker. Well, what should we do? Stop being weaker. What should we do? Stop being uh, um, what's the stop being uneducated. What should we don't you know? Don't you know, ladies and gentlemen, I'm dropping some some knowledge here. Don't you know that wars are not really won on the battlefield? They're won in the laboratory. Right. Whoever makes the best weapons win. Right. See, back in the days, yeah, or, you know, people came, they fought hand to hand combat. Right. But we ain't living in the hand to hand combat world anymore. We're, we're living in we're living in manufactured warfare. <laughs> we're, we're living in a time where where weapons are made. We're living in a time now where drones exist. We're living in a time now where 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 weapons are created. Military power is created in the laboratory and every nation, if they're smart, are looking to create weapons that can defend themselves with with as little uh, casualties as possible. And that happens, ladies and gentlemen, in the laboratory, not on the battlefield. And sometimes. We don't pay attention in school. Sometimes we don't pay attention in the laboratory. We want to just play basketball while other nations are building tanks and missiles, while other nations are building jets, while other nations are creating firepower, while other nations are creating bombs that are made out of sound, while other nations are creating biological warfare. Right. So I just want you to know the hand of the diligent will rule. While the slopeful, because sometimes we just like, well, all I need to do is just go to church. All I need to do is go to church. No, you also need to learn how to build fences. You also need to learn how to build houses. You also need to learn how to build roads. You also need to learn how to build cities and towns and, and communities and stuff like that. How are you going to be a ruler and there's nothing to rule? We got to build our family. Even if it just starts over with husband and wife, well, if, 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 if we can rule well as husband and wife, if we can just take care of our marriage, now all of a sudden we have kids, right? If we could just take care of our kids, all of a sudden we're gonna, they're going to find a spouse and we're going to have grandkids. And if we can just take care of them, what, what's happening? The tribe is getting bigger 
and bigger and bigger. And you what started off with two people is now 85 people. And if you're telling me there's a whole lot you can do with 85 people who's walking in the same vision. There's a lot you can do with 23 people who's walking in the same vision. But where the house is divided, the people can't stand. Right. So the hand of the diligent, we got to be diligent in our marriage, diligent in our personal life, diligent with our family, diligent with our in-laws, diligent with our nieces and nephews, diligent in the family unit so that we can have something that's worth ruling. If not, guess what? We'll become the slaves of other families who had the discipline and the power to rule. Let's keep going. Man, this is good stuff. I'm um, man. Y'all gonna have to listen to this on repeat because there's so much in here. Proverbs, this is this is spiritual warfare, ladies and gentlemen. We ain't have no prayer line yet. We ain't take up no offering. But if you listen into the words of this teaching, I told you this teaching will lift burdens. It will destroy yokes. It will set captives free. Stuff you've been praying about will be fulfilled when you grab a hold to the wisdom in this lesson. We ain't got time for the fake church. We ain't got time for all the emotional prayer lines that you done got up there 10, 15 times and you still didn't get a breakthrough. You've been hearing get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready a thousand times and you still don't got your breakthrough. You've been hearing people say your breakthrough is right around the corner and you went around five corners and still don't have your breakthrough. Why? Because there's some slopefulness in your life and it has not been addressed. But I come to let you know that we are rebuking that slowfulness in the name of Jesus in this presentation. We're not going to leave the same way we came. We're going to practice spiritual warfare. And the way we're going to practice spiritual warfare and engage in spiritual warfare is we're going to learn discipline. We're going to learn responsibility. We're going to do what needs to be done when it needs to be done. We're going to prepare. We're going to do the homework. We're going to be responsible. Hallelujah. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse four says a slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent, there goes that word diligent, makes rich. The, a slack hand causes poverty. Some people may be like, how is that possible? How can a slack hand cause poverty? Do anybody know what the definition of slack is? It simply means not giving what is needed. It simply means not giving 100 percent. Slack means you gave some, but not enough. You gave some, but not all. And so when you behave in a slack way, you gave help, but you only gave a little bit of help. <laughs> you participated, but you didn't give 100 percent. You did some work, but you didn't do all the work that was required. And guess what the results of that is? Poverty. You went to school, but you didn't really apply yourself. <laughs> you went to church, but you didn't really pay attention. You know, you read the scriptures, but you didn't really obey it the way you were supposed to. And then you're wondering why Satan is running rapid in your home. You're wondering why your emotional state is constantly up and down. You're wondering why depression is going coming in and out. That's because you're not... <laughs> You're slack concerning the word of God. You, you hear the word of God, but then you pay attention to the voice of Satan. And then Satan got you back in another mood swing. You know, now all of a sudden you're feeling bad about something you shouldn't even be feeling bad about. You're feeling bad about things you should be praising God about, right? But because you're slopeful, because you're slack when it comes to obeying God, because you're slack when it comes to obeying your parents, because you're slack when it comes to obeying the teacher at school, because you're slack when it comes to a work ethic, because you're slack when it comes to studying for that test, because you're slack when it comes to taking the time to understand your environment and how to approach that environment and dress appropriate for the environment, because you bring a knife to a gunfight, you lose, you lose, you lose, you lose, and you lose. You just keep on losing. Why? Because you keep on giving 50 percent, 20 percent, 10 percent, 30 percent. In order to win, it requires 100 percent. So we rebuke that incompleteness spirit. <laughs> we rebuke that spirit that says, I'm only going to give 30 percent when 100 percent is really given. We rebuke that spirit that goes halfway. We rebuke that spirit that only goes 80 percent. We rebuke that spirit that does that finds time to do everything else except what really needs to be done. We rebuke that spirit. Matter of fact, I rebuke I rebuke all those fake prayers, the prayers where people are like, Lord, I'm praying for this. You ain't praying for it. Your prayers are an abomination because the very same thing you're praying for, you're also being slowful in. So I rebuke that abominable spirit. I rebuke that abominable prayer. We ain't praying those kind of prayers anymore. 
right? We're not going to pray for breakthrough, but yet we're walking around with a slack hand. We're not going to pray for deliverance, but yet we keep walking around with a slack hand. We're not going to pray for blessings and prosperity, yet we keep walking around with a slack hand. No, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. We're not doing that. The prayer line is full with people who have a slack hand. You know, people like, man, I gave my offerings to the church, but I'm still not seeing my breakthrough because there's a slack hand somewhere in your life. There is slackness. You're, you're not giving. You're not operating the way you should. You're not giving the way you should. And I'm not talking about money all the time. I'm really talking about you're not giving attention the way you should. You're not properly participating. You're not properly studying. You're not properly being obedient. And so there's a there's a there's a domino effect that happens. And you think that just because I gave one hundred dollars in an offering that I'm supposed to now get this twenty thousand dollar return. Meanwhile, you have so much slack in your life, you know, you, the, the slackness in your life has dug you in such a deep hole and you think giving a hundred dollars at church is going to get you out of a 20 foot hole. No, bro. It's going to require diligence, <laughs> right? If bad behavior got you in the hole, good behavior is going to get you out, <laughs> right? Any of y'all ever dug a hole, right? If you notice, one could argue it takes about the same amount of time to fill the hole that it took to dig the hole. You know, we probably should do that one day. Let's dig a five foot hole and see how much time it took. And then let's fill back the hole. One thing we know, filling back that hole ain't going to happen in a second. It's going to take some time to fill back that hole. Right. And some people have lived their life with such slackness and it's put them in, it's put them behind a, a, a Put them between a rock and a hard place or put them behind the eight ball. And then sometimes they just expect I'm just do this one thing and then everything's going to be solved. No, some things require work. Some things require time. Right. And if and one of the things that's very hard for people to grow in is in discipline. They 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 want to be disciplined for two days and get the benefits of two years of discipline. And it's like, no, it took you almost a year to get into this hole. What makes you think? One decision you made on one day is going to get you out of it. I know a lot of prophets want to act like that. and be like, yeah, you're going to make this one decision and, and you're just coming out of it in the twinkling of an eye. But the reality is, saints, yes, that does happen. But those are exceptions to the rule. That doesn't happen for the majority of the people. I don't care how many orphans you give. I don't care how many so-called ties you pay. I don't care how many prayer meetings you came to. Some things just take time. Why? Because it's part of the law of God. It is part of the law of cause and effect. It's part of the law of sowing and reaping. You're going to commit a crime and have to spend 10 years in prison. And you go, well, I gave my life to the Lord. And you expect on day five? That just because you repented while you were in prison, that you ain't got to do nine more years of prison? Like, no, they're, they're, some things require work. Some things require you just going to have to sit there until that deliverance come. Because what the work that was done was so grievous and so so messed up. It just takes time. But may God give us the discipline to endure the time. Right. May God give us the patience and the long suffering that we need and and the faith. We need a whole lot of faith to go through that process. A slack hand causes poverty and there's a lot of poverty we see in the world. And that poverty is the result of a lot of slack hands. That poverty was the result of a lot of unpreparedness. That's that poverty is the result of a lack of discipline. Some of me, some people may be like, well, Sam, you don't understand. We were under oppression. I'm like, no, you don't understand. We don't always know how to fight. Somebody slapping you, I don't think it's wise to just stand there and let them slap you 50 more times. At, at least duck, <laughs> you know, at least, at least try to run away. Well, you don't understand. They brought drugs and cocaine into our neighborhoods. Well, the smart thing I would just think to say is just don't take it. Why would you take poison that they gave you? That's an idiot move. That's not the move of somebody who's wise. Well, you don't understand. They they want us to eat unhealthy. I don't recall nobody putting a gun to your head and forcing you to buy bad food at the supermarket. At what point will you take personal responsibility? At what point will I take personal responsibility? I used to love Little Debbie cakes as a child. Right. 
until I was diagnosed diabetic. Nobody put a gun to my head and said, buy these little Debbie cakes. Nobody put a gun to my head, ladies and gentlemen. There was other options. Y'all see where I'm going? There was other options. But we can be so slowful that we just accept the wicked stuff that's before us. We can be so slowful that we don't take the time to do our homework. We can be so slowful that we don't take the time to pay attention to people around us. So we got to deal with the consequences of our behavior. A slack hand causes poverty. A slack hand sometimes causes sickness. A slack hand sometimes causes depression, causes to put to put ourselves in in very terrible situations. But the hand of the diligent make it rich. And so, Lord, I pray that we learn diligence. Lord, I pray that we go beyond prayer. I pray that, Lord, that you that after prayer, you put the power in our hands and our feet and our body to do what needs to be done. Father, I pray that after prayer and fasting that we do what needs to be done. Lord, I pray that when the service is over, that we get up and become diligent. Lord, I pray after the preaching and the sermons are done, that we get up and do the hard work that is required. Lord, I pray that when we're done shouting, when we're done speaking in tongues, when we're done running around the church building for the 50th time, that we will actually be responsible and do what needs to be done. Lord, I pray that after we speak in tongues, we learn how to speak healthy in English. Lord, I pray that after we speak in tongues, that we can sit in front of that interviewer at work while they're interviewing us and we can speak words that they understand that will help us get the job. Lord, I pray after we are shouting and after we are giving God the glory, I pray we take that same energy talking about let God arise and his enemies be scattered, talking about I can do all things through Christ that strengthen me. Lord, I pray when Sunday is over and when Bible study is over, over when Sabbath day is over, I pray that the people of God will go into a wonderful Monday and not a blue Monday. They'll go in, they'll say, I could do all things when they go into that corporate office. They'll say, I can do all things when they start that business. They'll say, I can do all things as they prepare themselves for that wife, as they look for that husband, as they look for that spouse, as they look for that uh, wife, Lord. I prepare pray that they can still have that same energy that says, Lord, I can do all things when it's time to learn something new, when it's time to do something differently that I may not be familiar with doing. Lord, I pray that I will be diligent, that I don't give up after the first try or the second try. Lord, I pray that I can do it again the third time. I could do it again the fifth time. I could do it again the 50th time. I could do it again the 20th time. Why? Because great things take time. Great things take time. And, 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 and sometimes it just don't happen after the first prayer. Sometimes it don't happen after the first event. Sometimes you got to do that event trial and ever and you're learning from your mistakes and trial and ever and you're learning from your mistakes and you're getting better and better and better and better and better. And through the mistakes, you learn the nuances through the mistakes. You learn what not to do and what to do through the mistakes. You learn how to do things better and faster through the mistakes. You learn how to do things that are better and yet safer. You know how, how many times people die when trying to create something new, right? They're like, man, we can't do that no more. So-and-so died when we was trying to build that bridge. So-and-so died when we was trying to build that tunnel. So we got to learn. We got to learn some better techniques that we can still build it without losing all these lives. It takes time, ladies and gentlemen. So here we are in 2024. Sometimes we don't pay attention to all the diligence that went through building those bridges, all of the diligence that went through building America, all of the diligence that went through building your family, all of the diligence that went through building the, the country that you live in, wherever you may be, because I don't want to make this just about America, but all of the diligence that it that people had to go through just so that we could drive the kind of cars we have, just so that we can have the phones we have, just so that we can have the technology that we have. We need to learn diligence and we need to learn skills and we need to learn how to be great. Hallelujah. So may it not end with just a prayer meeting. May it not end with just going to a Bible study. But may we, wow, may we be strengthened when we pray. May the Bible studies build up our faith. May the church services build up our faith so that we can do what? So that we can leave that church building, leave that meeting and go conquer so that we can leave and go be great. That's the purpose of the gatherings. That is my prayer that when we leave from here, we go and what? Go be great. 
Hallelujah. Look at your neighbor and say, go be great. Go be great. Number five, we can be slowful in personal health. Got to wrap this up. We can be slowful in personal health. Slowful in personal health. Look what Proverbs 14 and 12 says. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is a way of death. Even in laughter, the heart may ache and the end of joy may be grief. I told you earlier that, you know, we, we you know, I, I used to eat all these little Debbie's as a kid, you know, eat all these little Debbie's as a kid. There's a way that seems right. Right. One of the one of the worst things you can do is do stuff that make you happy. You want to know why? Because <laughs> everything that's happy is not always beneficial. Everything that makes you feel good eventually doesn't always make you feel good. <laughs> Those little Debbie's made me feel good when I started. Right. But now what? Doesn't make me feel good. It affects your body the negative way. There's a way that seems right. Right. Some people may say, man, why does eating the bad food taste so good? Maybe it's because you don't know what good food tastes like. Maybe it's because we enjoy doing things that make us happy versus doing things that creates a good life. Maybe we maybe we value happiness over health. That could be the reason. Maybe we value happiness over truth. Just maybe we value happiness over good outcome. We say we want a good outcome. Well, if we want a good outcome, why are we so self-destructive? If we say we want a good outcome, how come the things we do creates a bad outcome? Because what we're doing seems right. And even when some people would warn you and be like, hey, you shouldn't be eating all that. Hey, you need to cut down on some of that. Hey, you shouldn't be eating that. You shouldn't be drinking that. And people were like, YOLO, only live once. Oh, man, this is good. Well, they make all kinds of excuses why they keep doing things, why they keep doing the bad things that they're doing. But it seems right. But the end of is a way of death. Slopeful people don't have good eating habits. They don't care to prepare good food. They don't care to take their time and read the nutrition facts, the nutritional facts. Wow, that's slowfulness. You just gonna put anything in your mouth? You just gonna feed anything to your kids that you claim you love? You just gonna give your spouse anything? You just gonna give yourself anything, right? You know how many people in the church is overweight and sometimes they're overweight. All the bad food we sell in the basement of the church. All the greasy food and fatty food and all the salty food that we sell in the, in the church. And then at the same time, we have all these people in the church, high blood pressure, diabetes, right? All this stuff, feeling fatigue, all that stuff. It could be, and yes, in many cases it is, it's just slowfulness in our eating habits. Let's keep going. Number six, we can be slowful in relational responsibilities. Colossians 3, 18 through 25. This passage sums up so much. Listen to what it says. Wives, submit to your husbands as fitting in the Lord. Relational responsibility. Verse 19. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Relational responsibilities. Verse 20. Children, obey your parents and everything for this pleases the Lord relational responsibilities. Verse 21, fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged, relational responsibility. Verse 22, bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasing, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord, relational responsibility. Verse 23, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward, you are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Ladies and gentlemen, God is strongly concerned about relational responsibility. I'm going to prove it to you even more. 
Titus chapter 3, verse 1 through 12, 2 says this, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authority. Let me read that again. Remind them to be submissive to who? Rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work. Yep, we need to pay attention to government, especially good government. Number two, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy towards all people. Again, relational responsibility. Listen to this. Let's go to Mark 12 and 28 through 34. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with another and seeing that he answered them well, talking about he, Jesus answered them well, he asked them, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. 31. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Watch this. There is no other commandment greater than these. Tell me God is not serious about relational responsibility. He definitely is. There is no other commandment greater than these. Loving God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and loving your neighbor as yourself. Now let's look at what verse 32 says. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there is none, no other beside him. Verse 33, and to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as one's self is what? Is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifice. I told you. That relational responsibility is very, very serious. He's like, no, like this is more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifice. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Ladies and gentlemen, we can end the debate if we learn how to interact with humanity the way God has prescribed, we can end the debate. We can debate. People could debate over shouting in church. People could debate over tongues. People can debate over how do you do church. People, people could debate over this and they can debate over that. But when it's all said and done, my question to you is, are you loving your neighbor the way Christ taught us to love them? The main question is, are we showing relational responsibility are we responsible as it relates to our relationships that we have with one another it's so important number seven we can be slowful in personal spiritual devotions luke 18 and 1 says this and he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart you should always pray and not lose heart that's that personal devotion prayer should be a part of our personal devotion we should have a prayer life we should have a private prayer life and we should have a public prayer life right we don't want to be slowful to personal devotion we don't want to be slowful to praying to god there's something about praying to god regularly there's something about praying to God that keeps your faith up. There's something about praying to God that keeps your ears open to what God is saying, right? We got to keep a heart of prayer. Got to have a heart of prayer. That is our personal devotion. Make time to pray. Make time to pray, not just once a day, not just twice a day, but at least three times a day, morning, afternoon, evening. Make time to pray. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 through 25 says this. Let us hold fast the profession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Verse 25, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, 
but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Brothers and sisters, we got to come together. We got a fellowship. Brothers and sisters, we still need to be in each other's face. Brothers and sisters, we still need to be around each other. Brothers and sisters, yes, we want to get the virtual connections. We want to connect with people online, but we need to come together face to face. We need to pray with the people of God. We need to fellowship with the people of God. We need to sing with the people of God. We need to, we need to study the word with the people of God. We need to have communion with the people of God, right? We need to confess our faults one to another. We need to pray for one another. We don't want to be slothful in that. Finally, we get to step eight. This is the last one. Slopeful in church mission. We don't want to be slopeful in church mission. First Timothy chapter four, verse 13 through 16. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given to you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things, immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Don't be slow in ministry. Don't be slow when it comes to the will of God for your life. Some of you, God has called you to preach. You should be preaching. You should be studying. You should be giving yourself to reading. You should be praying. You should be doing the work of an evangelist. You should be doing the work of a shepherd. You should be doing the work of whatever God has called you to do. You should be doing the work. Don't let real estate stop you from doing the work. Don't let the fact, well, we can't get a building or we can't get a storefront or we can't. Don't let that stuff stop you. Jesus did not call you to set up a building. He called you to preach the gospel. Jesus didn't call you to get into the real estate business. He called you to preach the gospel. He called you to be an evangelist. He called you to prophesy. He called you to teach. He called you to take the words that he gave you and give it out to others. That's what he called you to do. Nothing is wrong with a building, but you don't need a building to do the work of God. You can do it. And as things grow, God will provide. Some of us, we just want to we just want to get all this stuff and didn't even do the work yet. <laughs> you know, you got people want to get all these buildings and you only got three people for a building that can sit 50 and you just stressing everybody out. No, do the work of evangelists. Do, do home, home discussions. Do some discipleship. Grow first. Take the time and grow. Keep all that money in your pocket and do something better with all that. Acts chapter 20, verse 33 through 35. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands minister to my necessities and to those who were with me and all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Notice what Paul is saying, right? We're not going to be slothful. He said, well, I work with my own hands. He said, I'll work and provide for myself. Even, even if the church can't help, I'm still going to work and provide for myself. I'm not going to be slowful concerning the ministry that God has given me. Understand this. God called you to preach. God called you to teach. He called you to do that irregardless of whether somebody give you money, irregardless of whether somebody helps you out, irregardless of whether somebody says, thank you, pastor. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Sister. It doesn't matter if God has called you to do something. You do it. You don't you don't wait for the results then to do it. You just do it. Don't be slowful in this. Don't be slowful in sacrificing the things that you have, using the things that you have. Right. You want your stuff to look all good, but you don't want to use any of that stuff for God. No, don't be slowful. Luke chapter 14, verse 26 through 33 says this. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. What is Jesus saying? If you can't love them less, that's what he means by hate. He doesn't mean to literally hate them. He's just talking about you can't love them more than you love me. You got you to gotta love them less than me. If you can't do that, what does Jesus say? You can't be my disciple. You can't be my disciple. If, if, if your love for me is less than your love for other people, you can't be my disciple. You got to love me more than everybody else. Look what he says in verse 27. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Right? 
you got to give up things. You got to bear your own cross. There are, there's a sacrifices you have to give, the sacrifices you have to make if you want to be his disciple. You can't be slothful, right? Um, if slothful people will put many things in front of serving God, so you'd be amazed at the reason people say no to God. You'd be amazed at some of the reasons why people say no to participating in the work of the Lord. It's, it's crazy how insignificant those excuses are. Because a lot of people, they just want things the way they want it. They want things how they want it. And they don't want God disrupting any of that. They don't want God disrupting the look. They don't want God disrupting the flow. Right. They don't want God disrupting the plans. So anytime that happens, what's one of the things you start hearing? You start hearing them complain. You start hearing them complain. You start hearing them complain. But what I got is yours anyway, Lord. Use it however you want to use it. I'm just grateful to be a part of the number. I'm just grateful that I can participate. I'm just grateful that you have need of me. I'm grateful that you have need of my house. I'm grateful that you have need of my car. I'm thank you, grateful that you have need of my money. I'm grateful that you actually want me to participate. I thank you that I get to participate. Because you could do this without me. But thank you for inviting me. Thank you that I can participate. And not only that, not only participate, but I get a reward for participating. Thank you, Lord. Verse 28, for which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and acts for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. You can't get no clearer than that. Jesus says you got to be able to renounce it. You got, in other words, you got to be, you got to be willing to give it away. You got to be willing to share it. You got to be willing for the Lord to use it. And some things you got to just be willing to abandon because God is like, that's not for you. I don't want you to have it. Get rid of it. If we can't do that, ladies and gentlemen, we cannot be his disciple. We are talking about beware of the spirit of slowfulness. We said a lot in this presentation. This is at least, what, two and a half hours long now? I'm done. I'm thirsty and I'm hungry. I'm a little bit tired. But there are so much nuggets in this two and a half hour presentation that if you, we, pay attention to what was said, there's no way you can't be blessed from this. There's no way your life cannot improve. The Bible says where there is no vision, the people perish. That word vision means divine revelation. Where there is no divine revelation, the people perish. What you heard today is divine revelation. What you heard today is a vision, a word from the Lord. What you heard today is instructions from heaven. So when we yield to this, when we yield to this, there's going to be an outpouring of the blessings of God. There's going to be a breakthrough. There's going to be a lifting of burdens. There's going to be a fixing of, of problems. There's going to be solutions. There's going to be a positive outcome. And so that is what we pray for. We pray for outcome. Um, I'm done. Uh, were there any questions that came on? I know y'all was typing earlier. Let me pass me my phone there. <clears throat> Um, hopefully, uh, I did say that I would, hmm. Oh, how is a person saved initially? 
that was the question. Okay, so that was a complete different question. Um, I'll answer that in text. That's kind of out of the scope of this discussion. Um, um, I'll answer that. I'll respond to that in the text. I wanted to kind of stick with the the uh, the context of the topic, um, but I'll, I'll respond to that as I'm meeting. I'll write something up and send that to them so they can have that. Um, other than that, if there's no questions concerning this topic, um, we're going to dismiss because I did not expect to be this long. But yet at the same time, I'm glad that I did a lot was said. Um, and I know God will be glorified. I know he's glorified through this presentation. And I know he's also going to be glorified as we all walk by faith in response to this con to this conversation and presentation. So, Father, we thank you. Thank you for your grace, your word. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for what you have said to us through your word. The many nuggets you have given to us, Lord, the, the strong meat, Lord, that you've given to us in this presentation. Lord, I pray that it benefits your people. I know it will benefit your people, Lord, and I pray that their faith will be increased and that they will apply it to their life. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <clears throat>